Section 89 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 2, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. 1. The Able-Bodied Male Crossing Sweepers. Part 2. The Bearded Crossing Sweeper at the Exchange. Since the destruction by fire of the Royal Exchange in 1838, there has been added to the curiosities of Cornhill a thick-set, sturdy and hirsute crossing sweeper, a man who is as civil by habit as he is independent by nature. He has a long flowing beard, grey as wood smoke, and a pair of fierce moustaches, giving a patriarchal air of importance to a marked and observant face, which often serves as a painter's model. After half an hour's conversation, you are forced to admit that his looks do not at all belie him and that the old mariner, for such was his profession formerly, is worthy in some measure of his beard. He wears an old felt hat, very battered and discoloured. Around his neck, which is bared in accordance with sailor custom, he has a thick blue cotton neckerchief tied in a sailor's knot. His long iron-grey beard is accompanied by a healthy and almost ruddy face. He stands against the post all day, saying nothing, and taking what he can get without solicitation. When I first spoke to him, he wanted to know to what purpose I intended applying the information that he was prepared to afford, and it was not until I agreed to walk with him as far as St. Mary Axe that I was enabled to obtain his statement as follows. I've had this crossing ever since 38. The exchange was burnt down in that year. Why, sir, I was wandering about trying to get a crust, and it was very sloppy, so I took and got a broom, and while I kept a clean crossing, I used to get halfpence and pence. I got a dockman's wages, that's half a crown a day, sometimes only a shilling, and sometimes more. I have taken a crown, but that's very rare. The best customers I had is dead. I used to make a good Christmas, but I don't now. I have taken a pound or thirty shillings then in the old times. I smoke, sir. I will have tobacco, if I can't get grub. My old woman takes cares that I have tobacco. I have been a sailor, and the first ship as ever I was in was the old Colossus, 74. But we was only cruising about the channel then, and took two prizes. I went aboard the old Romewa, guard ship. We were turned over to her, and from her I was drafted over to the Escromander, frigate. We went out chasing Boney, but he gived himself up to the old impregnable. I was at the taking of Algiers in 1816, in the Superb. I was in the Rockfort, 74, up the Mediterranean. They call it up the Mediterranean, but it was the Malta station. Three years, ten months, and twenty days, until the ship was paid off. Then I went to work at the dockyard. I had a misfortune soon after that. I fell out of a garret window, three stories high, and that kept me from going to the docks again. I lost all my top teeth by that fall. I've got a scar here, one on my chin. But I weren't in the hospital more than two weeks. I was afraid of being taken up soliciting charity, and I knew that sweeping was a safe game. They couldn't take me up for sweeping at crossing. Sometimes I get insulted, only in words. Sometimes I get chaffed by sober people. Drunken men I don't care for. I never listen to them, unless they handle me. And then, although I am 63 this very day, sir, I think I could show them something. I do carry my age well, and if you could have seen how I have lived this last winter through, sometimes one pound of bread between two of us, You'd say I was a strong man to be as I am. Those who think that sweeping at crossing is idle work make a great mistake. In wet weather, the traffic that makes it get sloppy as soon as it's cleaned. Cabs and buses and carriages continually going over the crossing must scatter the mud on it, and you must look precious sharp to keep it clean. But when I once get in the road, I never jump out of it. I keeps my eye both ways, and if I get in too close quarters, I slips round the wheels. I've had them almost touch me. No, sir, I never got knocked down. In foggy weather, of course, it's no use sweeping at all. Parcels. It's very few parcels I get to carry now. I don't think I get a parcel to carry once in a month. There's buses and railways so cheap. A man would charge as much for a distance as a cab would take them. I don't come to the same crossing on Sundays. I go to the corner of Finch Lane. As to regular customers, I've none, to say regular. Some give me sixpence now and then. All those who used to give me regular are dead. I was abed when the exchange was burnt down. I have had this beard five years. I grew it to sit to artists when I got the chance, but it don't pay expenses. 
for I have to walk four or five miles and only get a shilling an hour. Besides, I'm often kept nearly two hours, and I get nothing for going and nothing for coming, but just for the time I'm there. Afore I wore it, I had a pair of large whiskers. I went to a gentleman then, an artist, and he did pay me well. He advised me to grow moustachers and the beard, but he hasn't employed me since. They call me Old Jack on the crossing, that's all they call me. I get more chaff from the boys than anyone else. They only say, why don't you get shaved? But I take no notice on them. Old Bill in Lombard Street, I knows him. He used to make a good thing of it, but I don't think he makes much now. My wife, I am married, sir, doesn't do anything. I live in a lodging house and I pay three shillings a week. I tell you what we has now when I go home. We has a pound of bread, a quarter of an ounce of tea and perhaps a red herring. I've had a weakness in my legs for two year. The veins come down, but I keep a bandage in my pocket and when I feels them coming down, I puts the bandage on till the veins go up again. It's through being on my legs so long, because I had very strong legs when young and want of good food. When you only have a bit of bread and a cup of tea, no meat, no vegetables, you find it out. But I'm as upright as a dart and as lissom as ever I was. I gives threepence for my brooms. I wears out three in a week in the wet weather. I always lean very hard on my broom, especially when the mud is sticky, as it is after the roads is watered. I am very particular about my brooms. I gives them away to be burned when many another would use them. The sweeper in Portman Square, who got permission from the police. A wild-looking man with long, straggling grey hair, which stood out from his head as if he brushed it the wrong way, and whiskers so thick and curling that they reminded one of the wool round a sheep's face, gave me the accompanying history. He was very fond of making use of the term honest crust, and each time he did so, he, Irish-like, pronounced it crust. He seemed a kind-hearted, innocent creature, half scared by want and old age. I'm blessed if I can tell which is the best crossing in London. But mine ain't no great shakes, for I don't take three shillings a week, not with persons going across, taking one week with another. But I thought I could get an honest crust at it, for I've got a crippled hand, which comed of its own accord, and I was in St. George's Hospital seven weeks. When I comed out, it was a cripple with me and I thought the crossing was better than going into the workhouse, for I likes my liberty. I've been on this crossing since last Christmas, was a twelve month. Before that, I was a bricklayer and plasterer. I've been thirty-two years in London. I can get as good a character as anyone anywhere, please God. For as to drunkards and all that, I was none of them. I was earning eighteen shilling a week, and sometimes with my overtime I've had twenty shilling, and even twenty-three shilling. Bricklayers is paid according to all the hours they works beyond ten, for that's the bricklayers' day. I was among the lime and the sand and the bricks, and then my hand come like this. Note, he held out a hand with all the fingers drawn up towards the middle, like the claw of a dead bird. End note. All the sinews have gone, as you see yourself, sir, so that I can't bend it or straighten it, for the fingers are like bits of stick, and you can't bend them without breaking them. When I couldn't lay hold of anything nor lift it up, I showed it to Master, and he sent me to his doctor, who gave me something to rub over it, for it was swelled up like. And then I went to St. George's Hospital, and they cut it over, and asked me if I could come indoors as an indoor patient. And I said yes, for I wanted to get it over sooner, and go back to my work, and earn an honest crust. Then they scarred it again, cut it seven times, and I was there many long weeks and when I comed out I could not hold any tool, so I was forced to keep on pawning and pledging to keep an honest crust in my mouth, and sometimes I'd only just be with a morsel to eat, and sometimes I'd be hungry, and that's the truth. What put me up to crossing sweeping was this. I had no other thing open to me but the workhouse, but of course I'd sooner be out on my liberty, though I was entitled to go into the house, of course, but I'd sooner keep out of it if I could earn an honest crust. One of my neighbours persuaded me that I should pick up a good crust at a crossing. The man who had been on my crossing was gone dead, and as it was empty, I went down to the police office in Marleybone Lane, and they told me I might take it, and give me liberty to stop. I was told the man who had been there before me had been on it fourteen years, and then was good times for gentle and simple and all, and it was reported that this man had made a good bit of money, at least so it was said. 
I thought I could make a living out of it, or an honest crust ; but it's a very poor living, I can assure you. When I went to it first, I done pretty fair for a crust, but it's only three shillings to me now. My missus has such bad health, or she used to help me with her needle. I can assure you, sir, it's only one day a week as I have a bit of dinner, and I often go without breakfast and supper too. I haven't got any regular customers that allow me anything. When the families is in town, sometimes they give me half a crown or sixpence now and then, perhaps once a fortnight or a month. They've got footmen and servant maids, so they never want no parcels taken. They make them do it. But sometimes I get a penny for posting a letter from one of the maids or something like that. The best day for us is Sunday. Sometimes I get a shilling, and when the families is in town, eighteen pence. But when the families is away and the weather so fine there's no mud, and only working people going to the chapels, they never looks at me, and then I'll only get a shilling. Another who got permission to sweep. An old Irishman who comes from Cork was spoken of to us as a crossing sweeper who had formerly obtained permission before exercising his calling, but I found upon questioning him that it was but little more than a true Hibernian piece of conciliation on his part, and indeed that out of fear of competition he had asked leave of the servants and policemen in the neighbourhood. It seems somewhat curious and illustrative of the rights of property among crossing sweepers that three or four intending sweepers, when they found themselves forestalled by the old man in question, had no idea of supplanting the Irishman, and merely remarked, Well, you're lucky to get it so soon, for we meant to take it. In reply to our questions, the man said, I came here in January last. I knew the old man was dead, who used to keep the crossin', and I thought I would like the kind of work, for I am getting blind and hard of hearing likewise. I've got no parish. Since the passing of the last act, I've never lived long enough in any one parish for that. I applied to Marabon, and they offered to send me back to Ireland, but I'd got no one to go to, no friends or relations, or if I have, they're as poor there as I am myself, sir. There was an old man here before me, he used to have a stool to rest himself on, and when he died last Christmas, a man as knew him and me asked me whether I would take it or no, and I said I would. His broom and stool were in the coal cellar at this corner house, Mr. Blank's, where he used to leave them at night times, and they gave them up to me. But I didn't use the stool, sir. It might be an obstruction to the passers-by, and, sir, it looks as if it was infirmity. But please the Lord, I'll git and make a stool for myself against the hard winter I will, being a carpenter by trade. I didn't ask the gentlefolks permission to come here, but I asked the police and the servants and such as that. I asked the servants at the corner house. I don't know whether they could have kept me away if I had not asked. Soon after I came here, the gentlefolks, some of them, stopped and spoke to me. So, says they, you've taken the place of the old man that did. Yes, I have, says I. Very well, says they, and they give me a halfpenny. That was all that occurred upon my taking to the crossing. But there were some others who would have taken it if I had not. They told me I was lucky in getting it so soon, or they would have had it. But I don't know who they are. I am seventy-three years old, the second of June last. My wife is about the same age, and very much afflicted with the rheumatis. And she injured herself two years ago by falling off a chair while she was taking some clothes off the line. Not to deceive you, sir, I get a shilling a week from one of my children and ninepence from another, and a little help from some of the others. I have seven children living, and have had tin. They are very much scattered, two are abroad. One is in the tinth hussars. He is kind to me. The one who allows me ninepence is a basket maker at Redden, and the shilling I get from my daughter, a servant, sir. One of my sons died in the Crimmy. He was in the thirteenth light dragoons, and died at Scutari on the 25th of May. They could not help me more than they try to do, sir. I only make about two shilling a week here, sir, and sometimes I don't take three halfpence a day. On Sundays I take about sevenpence, ninepence or tenpence, according as I see the people who give regular. Weather makes no difference to me, for though the sum is small, I am a regular pensioner like of theirs. I go to Summerstown Chapel, being a Catholic, for I'm not ashamed to own my religion before any man. When I go, it is at seven in the evening. Sometimes I go to St. Patrick's Chapel, Soho Square. I have not been to confession for two or three years. The last time was to Mr. Stanton at St. Patrick's. 
There's a poor woman, sir, who goes past here every Friday to get her pay from the parish, and as sure as she comes back again, she gives me a halfpenny. She does indeed. Sometimes the baker or the greengrocer gives me a halfpenny for minding their baskets. I'm perfectly satisfied. It's no use to grumble, and I might be worse off, sir. Yes, I go off errands sometimes, fetch water now and then, and post letters. But I do no odd jobs such as helping the servants to clean the knives and such like. No, they wouldn't let me behind the shadow of their doors. A third who asked leave. This one was a mild and rather intelligent man in a well-worn black dress coat and waistcoat, a pair of moleskin trousers, and a blue and white cotton neckerchief. I found him sweeping the crossing at the end of blank place, opposite the church. He every now and then regaled himself with a pinch of snuff, which seemed to light up his careworn face. He seemed very willing to afford me information. He said, I've been on this crossing four years. I am a bricklayer by trade, but you see how my fingers have gone. It's all rheumatic, sir. I took a great many colds. I had a great deal of underground work, and that tries a man very much. How did I get the crossing? Well, I took it. I came as a casualty. No one ever interfered with me. If one man leaves a crossing, well, another takes it. Yes, yeah, some crossings is worth a good deal of money. There was a black in Regent Street, at the corner of Conduit Street, I think, who had two or three houses, at least I've heard so. For I know for a certainty that the man in Cavendish Square used to get so much a week from the Duke of Portland. He got a shilling a day and eighteen pence on Sundays. I don't know why he got more on Sundays. I don't know whether he gets it since the old Duke's death. The boys worry me. I mean the little boys with brooms. They are an abusive set and give me a good deal of annoyance. They are so very cheeky. They watch the police away, but if they see the police coming, they bolt like a shot. There are a great many Irish lads among them. There were not nearly so many boys about a few years ago. I once made 18 pence in one day. That was the best day I ever made. It was very bad weather. But take the year through, I don't make more than sixpence a day. I haven't worked at bricklaying for a matter of six year. What did I do for the two years before I took to crossing sweeping? Why, sir, I had saved a little money and managed to get on somehow. Yes, I have had my troubles, but I never had what I call great ones, excepting my wife's blindness. She was blind, sir, for eleven year, and so I had to fight for everything. She has been dead two year come September. I have seven children, five boys and two girls. They are all grown up and got families. Yes, they ought among them to do something for me. But if you have to trust to children, you will soon find out what that is. If they want anything of you, they know where to find you. But if you want anything of them, it's no go. I think I made more money when first I swept this crossing than I do now. It's not a good crossing, sir. Oh, no. But it's handy home, you see. When a shower of rain comes on, I can run home and needn't go into a public house. But it's a poor neighbourhood. Oh, yes, indeed, sir. I am always here, certainly. I am laid up sometimes for a day with my feet. I am subject to the rheumatic gout, you see. Well, I don't know whether so much standing has anything to do with it. Yes, sir, I have heard of what you call shutting up shop. I never heard it called by that name before, though. But there's lots of sweepers as sweep back the dirt before leaving at night. I know they do, some of them. I never did it myself. I don't care about it. I always think there's the trouble of sweeping it back in the morning. People liberal? No, sir, I don't think there are many liberal people about. If people were liberal, I should make a good deal of money. Sometimes after I get home, I read a book, if I can borrow one. What do I read? Well, novels, when I can get them. What did I read last night? Well, Reynolds' Miscellany. Before that, I read The Pilgrim's Progress. I have read it three times over, but there's always something new in it. Well, weather makes very little difference in this neighbourhood. My rent is two and sixpence a week. I have a little relief from the parish. How much? Two and sixpence. How much does my living cost? Well, I am forced to live on what I can get. I manage as well as I can. If I have a good week, I spend it. I get more nourishment then, that's all. I used to smoke, sir, a great deal, but I haven't touched a pipe for a matter of forty year. Yes, sir, I take snuff, scotch and rapee mixed. If I go without a meal of victuals, I must have my snuff. I take an ounce a week, sir. It costs fourpence. That there is the only luxury I get, unless somebody gives me a half pint of beer. I very rarely get an odd job. This is not the neighbourhood for them things. 
** Yes, sir, I go to church on Sunday. I go to All Souls, in Langham place, the church with the sharp spire. I go in the morning ; once a day is quite enough for me. In the afternoon I generally take a walk in the park, or I go to see one of my young ones. They won't come to the old crossing sweeper, so I go to them." A Regent Street Crossing Sweeper a man who had stationed himself at the end of Regent Street, near the county fire office, gave me the following particulars. He was a man far superior to the ordinary run of sweepers, and, as will be seen, had formerly been a gentleman's servant. His costume was of that peculiar miscellaneous description which showed that it had from time to time been given to him in charity, a dress coat so marvellously tight that the stitches were stretching open, a waistcoat with a remnant of embroidery, and a pair of trousers which wrinkled like a groom's top boot, had all evidently been part of the wardrobe of the gentleman whose errands he had run. His boots were the most curious portion of his toilet, for they were large enough for a fisherman, and the portion unoccupied by the foot had gone flat and turned up like a Turkish slipper. He spoke with a tone and manner which showed some education. Once or twice, whilst I was listening to his statement, he insisted upon removing some dirt from my shoulder, and, on leaving, he by force seized my hat and brushed it, all which habits of attention he had contracted whilst in service. I was surprised to see, stuck in the wristband of his coat-sleeve, a row of pins, arranged as neatly as in the papers sold at the mercers. Since the Irish have come so much, the boys, I mean, my crossing has been completely cut up, he said and yet it is in as good a spot as could well be, from the county fire office, Mr. Beaumont as owns it, to Swan and Edgar's. It ought to be one of the first crossings in the kingdom, but these Irish have spiled it. I should think, as far as I can guess, I've been on it eight year, if not better, but it was some time before I got known. You see, it does a feller good to be some time on a crossing, but it all depends, of course, whether you are honest or not, for it's according to your honesty as you get rewarded. By rewarded, I means you gets a character given to you by word of mouth. For instance, a party wants me to do a job for him, and they says, Can you get any lady or gentleman to speak for you? And I says, Yes, and I gets my character by word of mouth. That's what I calls being rewarded. Before ever I took a broom in hand, the good times had gone for crossings and sweepers. The good times was thirty year back. In the regular season, when they, the gentry, are in town, I have taken from one and sixpence to two shillings a day, but every day's not alike, for people stop at home on wet days. But you see, in winter time the crossings ain't no good, and then we turn off to shoveling snow, so that you see a shilling a day is even too high for us to take regular all the year round. Now, I ain't taken a shilling, no, nor a blessed bit of silver, for these three days, all the qualities out of town. It ain't what a man gets on a crossing as keeps him, that ain't worth mentioning. I don't think I take sixpence a day regular all the year round, mind, on the crossing. No, I'd take my solemn oath I don't. If you was to put down fourpence, it would be nearer the mark. I'll tell you the use of a crossing to such as me and my likes. It's our shop, and it ain't what we gets a sweeping, but it's a place like for us to stand, and then people as wants us comes and fetches us. In the summer I do a good deal in jobs. I do anything in the portering line. Or if I'm called to do boots and shoes, or clean knives and forks, then I does that. But that's only when people's busy, for I've only got one regular place I goes to, and that's in A Street, Piccadilly. I goes messages, parcels, letters, and anything that's required, either for the master of the hotel or the gents that uses there. Now there's one party at Swan and Edgar's, and I goes to take parcels for him sometimes, and he won't trust anybody but me, for you see I'm known to be trustworthy and then they reckons me as safe as the bank. There, that's just it. I got to the hotel only lately. You see, when the peace was on, and the soldiers was coming home from the crimmy, then the governor, he was exceeding busy, so he give me two shillings a day, and my board. But that wasn't regular, for as he wants me, he comes and fetches me. It's a nigh impossible to say what I makes. It don't turn out regular. Sunday's a shilling, or one and sixpence. Other days, nothing at all. Not salt to my porridge. You see, when I helps the party at the hotel, I gets my food, and that's a lift. I've never put down what I made in the course of the year, but I've got enough to find food and raiment for myself and family. Sir, I think I may say I gets about six shillings a week, but it ain't more. I've been abroad a good deal. 
I was in Cape Town, Table Bay, one and twenty miles from Simon's Town. For you see, the French mans of war comes in at Cape Town, and the English mans of war comes in at Simon's Town. I was a gentleman's servant over there, and a very good place it was. And if anybody was to have told me years back that I was to have come to what I am now, I could never have credited it. But misfortunes has brought me to what I am. I come to England, thinking to better myself, if so be it was the opportunity. Besides, I was tired of Africa, and anxious to see my native land. I was very hard up, I very hard up indeed, before I took to the cross. And in preference to turning out dishonest, I says, I'll buy a broom and go and sweep, and get an honest livelihood. There was a Jewish lady and her husband used to live in the succus, and I knowed them and the family. Very fine sons they was, and I went into the shop to ask them to let me work before the shop, and they give me their permission so to do. And says she, I'll allow you threepence a week. They've been good friends to me, and send me a messages, and wherever they be, may they do well, I says. I sometimes get clothes give to me, but it's only at Christmas times, or after it's over, and that helps me along, it does so indeed. Whenever I sees a pin or a needle, I picks it up. Sometimes I finds as many as a dozen a day, and I always sticks them either in my cuff or in my waistcoat. Very often a lady sees em, and then they comes to me and says, Can you oblige me with a pin? And I says, Oh yes, ma'am, a couple or three if you requires them. But it turns out very rare that I gets a trifle for anything like that. I only does it to be obliging. Besides, it makes you friends like. I can't tell who's got the best crossing in London. I'm no judge of that. It isn't a broom as can keep a man now. They're going out of town so fast, all the aristocracy, though it's middling classes, such as is in a middling way like, as is the best friend to me. A Tradesman's Crossing Sweeper A man who had worked at crossing sweeping as a boy when he first came to London, and again when he grew too old to do his work as a labourer in a coal yard, gave me a statement of the kind of life he led and the earnings he made. He was an old man, with a forehead so wrinkled that the dark waved lines reminded me of the grain of oak. His thick hair was, despite his great age, which was nearly seventy, still dark, and as he conversed with me, he was continually taking off his hat and wiping his face with what appeared to be a piece of flannel about a foot square. His costume was of what might be called the all-sorts kind, and from constant wear it had lost its original colour and had turned into a sort of dirty green-grey hue. It consisted of a waistcoat of tweed, fastened together with buttons of glass, metal and bone, a tailcoat turned brown with weather, a pair of trousers repaired here and there with big stitches like the teeth of a comb, and these formed the extent of his wardrobe. Around the collar of the coat and waistcoat, and on the thighs of the pantaloons, the layers of grease were so thick that the fibre of the cloth was choked up, and it looked as if it had been pierced with bits of leather. Rubbing his unshorn chin, whereon the bristles stood up like the pegs in the barrel of a musical box, until it made a noise like a hairbrush, he began his story. I'm known all about in Parliament Street, ay, every bit about them parts, for more than thirty year. I am as well known as the study itself, all about them parts at Charing Cross. Afore I took to crossing sweeping, I was at coal work, the coal work I did was backing and filling, and anything in that way. I worked at Woods and Pennies and Douglases. They were good masters, Mr. Wood specially, but the work was too much for me as I got old. There was plenty of coal work in them times. Indeed, I've yearned as much as nine shillings of a day. That was the time as the meters was on. Now men can hardly earn a living at coal work. I left the coal work because I was took ill with a fever, and was brought on by sweating. Over exaction, they called it. It left me so weak, I wasn't able to do nothing in the yards. I know Mr. G, the fishmonger, and Mr. J, the publican. I should think Mr. J has knowed me this eight and thirty year, and they put me on to the crossing. You see, when I was odd man at a coal job, I'd go and do whatever there was to be done in the neighbourhood. If there was anything as Mr. G's men couldn't do, such as carrying fish home to a customer when the other men were busy, I was sent for or Mr. J would send me with spirits, a gallon or half a gallon or anything of that sort, a long journey. In fact, I'd get anything as come handy. I had done crossing sweeping as a boy, before I took to coal work, when I first come out of the country. My own head first put me up to the notion, and that's more than fifty year ago, aye, more than that. But I can't call to mind exactly, 
for I've had no parents ever since I was eight year old, and now I'm nigh seventy. But it's as close as I can remember. I was about thirteen at that time. There was no police on them, and I saw a good bit of road as was dirty, and says I, that's a good spot to keep clean, and I took it. I used to go up to the tops of the houses to throw over the snow, and I've often been obliged to get men to help me. I suppose I was about the first person as ever swept a crossing in Charing Cross. Note, here, as if proud of the fact, he gave a kind of moist chuckle, which ended in a fit of coughing. End note. I used to make a good bit of money then, but it ain't worth nothing now. After I left coal-backing, I went back to the old crossing opposite the Admiralty Gates, and I stopped there until Mr. G gives me the one I'm on now, and thank him for it, I says. Mr. G had the crossing paved, as leads to his shop, to accommodate the customers. He had a German there to sweep it afore me. He used to sweep it in the day, come about ten or eleven o'clock in the morning, and then at night he turned watchman. When there was any wensin, as Mr. G deals in, hanging out, he was put to watch it. This German worked there, I reckon, about seven year, and when he died, I took the crossing. The crossing ain't much of a living for anybody, that is, what I takes on it. But then, I've got regular customers as gives me money. There's Mr. G, he gives me a shilling a week, and there's Captain R, of the Admiralty, he gives me sixpence a fortnight. And another captain of the name of R, he gives me fourpence every Sunday. Ah, I forgot Mr. O, the secretary at the Admiralty. He gives me sixpence now and then. Besides, I do a lot of odd jobs for different people. They knows where to come and find me when they wants me. They gets me to carry letters or a parcel or a box or anything of that there. I has a bit of victuals too, give me every now and then. But as for money, it's very little as I get on the crossings. Perhaps seven or eight shillings a week, regular customers and all. I never heard of anybody as was leaving a crossing selling it. No, never. My crossing ain't a regular one as anybody could have. If I was to leave, it depends upon whether Mr. G would like to have the party, as to who gets it. There's no such thing as turning a regular sweeper out. The police stops that. I've been known to them for years, and they are very kind to me. As they comes by, they says, Jimmy, how are you? You see, my crossing comes handy for them, for it's against Scotland Yard and when they turns out in their clean boots, it saves their blacking. Lord G used to be at the Admiralty, but he ain't there now. I don't know why he left, but he's gone. He used to give me sixpence every now and then when he come over. I was near to my crossing when Mr Drummond was shot, but I wasn't near enough to hear the pistol. But I didn't see nothing. I knowed the late Sir Robert Peel, oh certainly, but he seldom crossed over my crossing, though whenever he did, he'd give me something. The present Sir Robert goes over to the chapel in Spring Gardens when he's in town, but he keeps on the other side of the way, so I never have anything from him. He's the very picture of his father, and I knows him from that, only his father were rather stouter than he is. I don't know none of the members of Parliament. They most of them keeps on shifting so, so I hasn't no time to recognise him. The watering carts ain't no friends of ourn. They makes dirt and no pay for cleaning it. There's so much traffic with coaches and carts going right over my crossing that a fine or wet day don't make much difference to me, for people are afraid to cross for fear of being run over. I'm forced to have my eyes about me and dodge the vehicles. I never heard, as I can tell on, of a crossing sweeper being run over. 2. The Able-Bodied Female Crossing Sweepers The Old Woman Over the Water She is the widow of a sweep. As respectable and industrious a man, I was told, as any in the neighbourhood of the borough. He was a short man, sir, very short, said my informant, and had a weakness for top boots, white hats, and leather breeches. And in that unsweep-like costume, he would parade himself up and down the Dover and New Kent roads. He had a capital connection, or, as his widow terms it, seat of business and left behind him a good name and reputation that would have kept the seat of business together if it had not been for the misconduct of the children, two of whom, sons, have been transported, while a daughter went wrong, though she, wretched creature, paid a fearful penalty, I learnt, for her frailties, having been burnt to death in the middle of the night, through a careless habit of smoking in bed. The old sweeper herself, eighty years of age, and almost beyond labour, very deaf, and rather feeble to all appearance, yet manages to get out every morning between four and five, so as to catch the workmen and timekeepers on their way to the factories. She has the true obsequious curtsy, but is said to be very strong in her likes and dislikes. 
She bears a good character, though sometimes inclining, I was informed, towards " the other half pint," but never guilty of any excess. She is somewhat profuse in her scriptural ejaculations and professions of gratitude. Her statement was as follows :— "Fifteen years I've been on the crossing, come next Christmas. My husband died in Guy's Hospital, of the cholera, three days after he got in, and I took to the crossing some time after. I had nothing to do. I am eighty years of age, and I couldn't do hard work. I have nothing but what the great God above pleases to give me. The poor woman who had the crossing before me was killed, and so I took it. The gentleman who was the foreman of the road gave me the grant to take it. I didn't ask him, for poor people as wants a bit of bread, they goes on the crossings as they likes. But he never interfered with me. The first day I took sixpence. But them good times is all gone. They'll never come back again. The best times I used to take a shilling a day, and now I don't take but a few pence. The winter is as bad as the summer, for poor people haven't got it to give, and gentlefolks get very near now. People are not so liberal as they used to be, and they never will be again. To do a hard day's washing, I couldn't. I used to go to a lady's house to do a bit of washing when I had my strength, but I can't do it now. People going to their offices at six or seven in the morning gives me a halfpenny or a penny. If they don't, I must go without it. I go at five and stand there till eleven or twelve, till I find it is no use being there any longer. Oh, the gentlemen give me the most, I'm sure. The ladies don't give me nothing. At Christmas I get a few things. A gentleman gave me these boots I've got on, and a ticket for a half-quarter loaf and a hundred of coals. I have got as much as five shillings at Christmas, but those times will never come back again. I get no more than two shillings and sixpence at Christmas now. My husband, Thomas Blank, was his name, was a chimney sweep. He did a very good business. It was all done by his sons. We had a boy with us too, just as a friendly boy. I was a mother and a mistress to him. I've had eleven children. I'm grandmother to fifteen, and a great-grandmother too. They won't give me a bite of bread, though, any of them. I've got four children living, as far as I know, two abroad and two home here with families. I never go among them. It is not in my power to assist them, so I never go to distress them. I get two shilling a week from the parish, and I have to pay out of that for a quartern loaf, a quartern of sugar, and an ounce of tea. The parish forces it on me, so I must take it, and that only leaves me one shilling and fourpence. A shilling off it goes for my lodging. I lodge with people who knew my family and me, and took a liking to me. They let me come there instead of wandering about the streets. I stand on my crossing till I'm like to drop over my broom with tiredness. Yes, sir, I go to church at St. George's in the borough. I go there every Sunday morning, after I leave my roads. They've taken the organ and charity children away that used to be there when I was a girl, so it's not a church now, it's a chapel. There's nothing but the preacher and the gentlefolks, and they sings their own psalms. There are gatherings at that church, but whether it's for the poor or not, I don't know. I don't get any of it. It was a great loss to me when my husband died. I went all to ruin then. My father belonged to Scotland at Edinburgh. My mother came from Yorkshire. I don't know where Scotland is, no more than the dead. My father was a gentleman's gardener and watchman. My mother used to go out a chairing, and she was drowned just by Horsemonger Lane. She was coming through the halfpenny hatch that used to be just facing the crown and anchor in the New Kent Road. There was an open ditch there, sir. She took a left-hand turning instead of the right and was drowned. My father died in St. Martin's workhouse. He died of apoplexy fit. I used to mind my father's place till mother died. His housekeeper I was, God help me, a fine one too. Thank the Lord, my husband was a clever man. He had a good seat of business. I lost my right hand when he died. I couldn't carry it on. There was my two sons went for soldiers, and the others were above their business. He left a seat of business worth a hundred pound. He served all up the New Kent Road. He was beloved by all his people. He used to climb himself when I first had him, but he left it off when he got children. I had my husband when I was fifteen, and kept him forty years. Ah, he was well beloved by all around, except his children, and they behaved shameful. I said to his eldest son when he lay in the hospital, asking your pardon, sir, for mentioning it, I says to his eldest son, Billy, says I, your father's very bad. Why don't you go to see him? Oh, says he, he's all right. He's getting better. And he was never the one to go and see him once. And he never come to the funeral. Billy thought I should come upon him after his death. But I never troubled him for as much as a crumb of bread. 
I never get spoken to in my roads, only some people say, good morning, there you are, old lady. They never ask me no questions whatsomever. I never get run over, though I am very hard of hearing. But I am forced to have my eyes here, there and everywhere, to keep out of the way of the carts and coaches. Some days I goes to my crossing, and earns nothing at all. Other days it's sometimes fourpence, sometimes sixpence. I earned fourpence today, and I had a bit of snuff out of it. Why, I believe I did yearn five pence yesterday. I won't tell no story. I got nine pence on Sunday. That was a good day. But God knows that didn't go far. I yearned so much, I couldn't bring it home on Saturday. It almost makes me laugh. I yearned sixpence. I goes every morning, winter or summer, frost or snow, and at the same hour, five o'clock. People certainly don't think of giving so much in fine weather. Nobody ever mislested me, and I never mislested nobody. If they gives me a penny, I thanks them, and if they gives me nothing, I thanks them all the same. If I was to go into the house, I shouldn't live three days. It's not that I eat much, a very little is enough for me, but it's the air I should miss. To be shut up like a thief, I couldn't live long, I know. The Old Woman Crossing Sweeper Who Had a Pensioner This old dame is remarkable from the fact of being the chief support of a poor deaf cripple, who is as much poorer than the crossing sweeper as she is poorer than Mrs. Blank in Blank Street, who allows the sweeper sixpence a week. The crossing sweeper is a rather stout old woman, with a carneying tone and constant curtsy. She complains, in common with most of her class, of the present hard times, and reverts longingly to the good old days when people were more liberal than they are now and had more to give. She says, I was on my crossing before the police was made, for I am not able to work and only get helped by the people who knows me. Mr. Blank, in the square, gives me a shilling a week. Mrs. Blank, in Blank Street, gives me sixpence. She has gone in the country now, but she has left it at the oil shop for me. That's what I depends upon, darling, to help pay my rent, which is half a crown. My rent was three shillings, till the landlord didn't wish me to go, cause I was so punctual with my money. I give a corner of my room to a poor creetur who's deaf as a beetle. She works at the soldier's colts and is a very good hand at it and would earn a good deal of money if she had constant work. She owed as good as twelve shillings and sixpence for rent, poor thing, where she was last, and the landlord took all her goods except her bed. She's got that, so I give her a corner of my room for charity's sake. We must look to one another. She's as poor as a church mouse. I thought she would be company for me. Still, a deaf person is but poor company to one. She had that heavy sickness they call the cholera about five years ago, and it fell in her side and in the side of her head too. That made her deaf. Oh, she's a poor object. She has been with me since the month of February. I've lent her money out of my own pocket. I give her a cup of tea or a slice of bread when I see she hasn't got any. Then the people upstairs are kind to her and give her a bite and a sup. My husband was a soldier. He fought at the Battle of Waterloo. His pension was ninepence a day. All my family are dead except my grandson what's in New Orleans. I expect him back this very month that now we have. He gave me four pounds before he went to carry me over the last winter. If the Almighty God pleases to send him back, he'll be a great help to me. He's all I've got left. I never had but two children in all my life. I worked in noblemen's houses before I was married to my husband, who is dead. But he came to be poor, and I had to leave my houses where I used to work. I took tuppence halfpenny yesterday, and threepence today. The day before yesterday, I didn't take a penny. I never come out on Sunday. I goes to Rosamond Street Chapel. Last Saturday, I made one shilling and sixpence, on Friday sixpence. I dare say I make three shillings and sixpence a week, besides the one shilling and sixpence I gets allowed me. I am forced to make a do of it somehow, but I've no more strength left in me than this old broom. The crossing sweeper who had been a servant maid. She is to be found any day between eight in the morning and seven in the evening, sweeping away in a convulsive, jerky sort of manner, close to Blank Square, near the foundling. She may be known by her pinched up straw bonnet, with a broad, faded, almost colourless ribbon. She has weak eyes and wears over them a brownish shade. Her face is tied up because of a gathering which she has on her head. She wears a small old plaid cloak, a clean-checked apron, and a tidy printed gown. She is rather shy at first, but willing and obliging enough withal, and she lives down Little Blank Yard, in Great Blank Street. 
The " yard " that is made like a mouse trap, small at the entrance, but amazingly large inside, and dilapidated though extensive. Here are stables and a couple of blind alleys, nameless, or bearing the same name as the yard itself, and wherein are huddled more people than one could count in a quarter of an hour, and more children than one likes to remember — dirty children, listlessly trailing an old tin baking dish, or a worn out shoe tied to a piece of string. Sullen children, who turn away in a fit of sleepy anger if spoken to. Screaming children, setting all the parents in the yard at defiance. And quiet children, who are arranging banquets of dirt in the reeking gutters. The yard is devoted principally to costermongers. The crossing sweeper lives in the top room of a two-storied house in the very depth of the blind alley at the end of the yard. She has not even a room to herself, but pays one shilling a week for the privilege of sleeping with a woman who gets her living by selling tapes in the street. Ah, says the sweeper, poor woman, she has a hard time of it. Her husband is in the hospital with a bad leg. In fact, he's scarcely ever out. If you could hear that woman cough, you'd never forget it. She would have had to starve today if it hadn't been for a person who actually lent her a gown to pledge to raise her stock money, poor thing. The room in which these people live has a sloping roof and a small paned window on each side. For furniture there were two chairs and a shaky three-legged stool, a deal table and a bed rolled up against the wall, nothing else. In one corner of the room lay the last lump remaining of the seven pounds of coals. In another corner there were herbs in pans and two water bottles without their noses. The most striking thing in that little room was some crockery the woman had managed to save from the wreck of her things. Among this, curiously enough, was a soup tureen with its lid not even cracked. There was a piece of looking glass, a small three-cornered piece, forming an almost equilateral triangle, and the oldest and most rubbed and worn-out piece of mirror that ever escaped the dustbin. The fireplace was a very small one, and on the table were two or three potatoes and about one-fifth of a red herring, which the poor street seller had saved out of her breakfast to serve for her supper. "'Take my solemn word for it, sir,' said the sweeper, "'and I wouldn't deceive you. That is all she will get besides a cup of weak tea when she comes home tired at night.' The statement of this old sweeper is as follows. "'My name is Mary Blank. I live in Blank Yard.' I live with a person of the name of Blank in the back attic. She gets her living by selling flowers and pots in the street, but she is now doing badly. I pay her a shilling a week. My parents were Welsh. I was in service, or maid of all work, till I got married. My husband was a seafaring man when I married him. After we were married, he got his living by selling memorandum almanac books and the like about the streets. He was driven to that because he had no trade in his hand, and he was obliged to do something for a living. He did not make much, and over-exertion with want of nourishment brought on a paralytic stroke. He had the first fit about two years before he had the second. The third fit, which was the last, he had on the Monday and died on the Wednesday week. I have two children still living. One of them is married to a poor man who gets his living in the streets. But as far as lays in his power, he makes a good husband and father. My other daughter is living with a niece of mine, for I can't keep her, sir. She minds the children. My father was a journeyman shoemaker. He was killed, but I cannot remember how. I was too young. I cannot recollect my mother. I was brought up by an uncle and aunt till I was able to go to service. I went out to service at five, to mind children under a nurse, and I was in service till I got married. I had a great many situations. You see, sir, I was forced to keep in place, because I had nowhere to go to, my uncle and aunt not being able to keep me. I was never in noblemen's families, only tradespeople's. Service was very hard, sir, and so I believe it continues. I am fifty-five years of age, and I have been on the crossing fourteen years, but just now it is very poor work indeed. Well, if I wishes for bad weather, I'm only like other people, I suppose. I have no regular customers at all. The only one I had left has lost his senses, sir. Mr. H, he used to allow us sixpence a week, but he went mad, and we don't get it now. By us, I mean the three crossing sweepers in the square where I work. Indeed, I like the winter time, for the families is in. Though the weather is more severe, yet you do get a few more halfpence. I take more from the staid elderly people than from the young. 
At Christmas I think I took about eleven shillings, but certainly not more. The most I ever made at that season was fourteen shillings. The worst about Christmas is that those who give much then generally hold their hand for a week or two. A shilling a day would be as much as I want, sir. I have stood in the square all day for a halfpenny, and I have stood there for nothing. One week with another, I make two shillings in the seven days, after paying for my broom. I've taken threepence halfpenny today. Yesterday, let me see, well, it was threepence halfpenny too. Monday, I don't remember, but Sunday, I recollect, it was fippence halfpenny. Years ago, I made a great deal more, nearly three times as much. I come about eight o'clock in the morning, and go away about six or seven. I'm here every day. The boys used to come at one time with their brooms, but they're not allowed here now by the police. I should not think crossings worth purchasing, unless people made a better living on them than I do. I gave the poor creature a small piece of silver for her trouble, and asked her if that, with the threepence halfpenny, made a good day. She answered heartily, I should like to see such another day tomorrow, sir. Yes, winter is very much better than summer, only for the trial of standing in the frost and snow. But we certainly do get more then. The families won't be in town for three months to come yet. Ah, uh, this neighbourhood is nothing to what it was. By God's removal, and by their own removal, the good families are all gone. The present families are not so liberal, nor so wealthy. It is not the richest people that give the most. Tradespeople, and especially gentlefolks who have situations, are better to me than the nobleman who rides in his carriage. I always go to Trinity Church, Gray's Inn Road, about two doors from the Welsh School. The Reverend Dr. Witherington preaches there. I always go on Sunday afternoon and evening, for I can't go in the morning. I can't get away from my crossing in time. I never omit a day in coming here, unless I'm ill, or the snow is too heavy, or the weather too bad, and then I'm obligated to resign. I have no friends, sir, only my children. My uncle and aunt have been dead a long time. I go to see my children on Sunday, or in the evening when I leave here. After I leave, I have a cup of tea, and after that, I go to bed. Very frequently, I'm in bed at nine o'clock. I have my cup of tea if I can any way get it, but I'm forced to go without that sometimes. When my sight was better, I used to be very partial to reading, but I can't see the print, sir, now. I used to read the Bible and the newspaper, story books I have read too, but not many novels. Yes, Robinson Crusoe I know, but not The Pilgrim's Progress. I've heard of it, they tell me it's a very interesting book to read, but I never had it. We never have any ladies or scripture readers come to our lodgings. You see, we're so out. They might come a dozen times and not find us at home. I wear out three brooms in a week, but in the summer one will last a fortnight. I give threepence halfpenny for them. There are twopenny halfpenny brooms, but they are not so good. They are liable to have their handles come out. It is very fatiguing standing so many hours. My legs aches with pain and swells. I was once in Middlesex Hospital for sixteen weeks with my legs. My eyes have been weak from a child. I have got a gathering in my head from catching cold standing on the crossing. I had the fever this time twelve month. I laid a fortnight and four days at home and seven weeks in the hospital. I took the diarrhoea after that and was six weeks under the doctor's hands. I used to do odd jobs, but my health won't permit me now. I used to make two or three shillings a week by him and get scraps and things, but I get no broken victuals now. I never get anything from servants. They don't get more than they know what to do with. I don't get a drop of beer once in a month. I don't know but what this being out may be the best thing after all, for if I was at home all my time, it would not agree with me. Statement of Old John, the waterman at the Farringdon Street cab stand, concerning the old black crossing sweeper who left £800 to Miss Waithman. Yes, sir, I knew him for many year, though I never spoke to him in all my life. He was a stoutish, thick-set man about my build, and used to walk with his broom up and down. So, note, here old John imitated the halt and stoop of an old man, end note. He used to touch his hat continually, he went on. Please remember the poor black man, was his cry, never anything else. Oh yes, he made a great deal of money. People gave more then than they do now. Where they give one sixpence now, they used to give ten. It's just the same by our calling. Lived humbly? Yes, I think he did. At all events, he seemed to do so when he was on his crossing. He got plenty of odds and ends from the corner there, Alderman Waithman's, I mean. He was a very sober, quiet sort of man. 
** No, sir, nothing peculiar in his dress. Some blacks are peculiar in their dress, but he would wear anything he could get give him. They used to call him Romeo, I think. Curious name, sir ; but the best man I ever knew was called Romeo, and he was a black. ** The crossing sweeper had his regular cus tomers. He knew their times, and was there to the moment. Oh, yes, he was always. Hail, rain, or snow, he never missed. I don't know how long he had the crossing. I remember him ever since I was a postboy in Doctors' Commons. I knew him when I lived in Holborn, and I haven't been away from this neighbourhood since 1809. No, sir, there's no doubt about his leaving the money to Miss Waithman. Everybody round here knows it. Just ask them, sir. Miss Waithman, an old maid she were, sir, used to be very kind to him. He used to sweep from Alderman Waithman's, it's the Sunday Times now, across to the opposite side of the way. When he died, an old man as had been a soldier took possession of the crossing. How did he get it? Why, I say, he took it. First come, first served, sir, that's their way. They never sell crossings. Sometimes, for a lark, they shift, and then one stands treat, a gallon of beer or something of that sort. The police interfered with the soldier. You know the sweepers is all forced to go if the police interfere. Now with us, sir, we are licensed, and they can't make us move on. They interfered, I say, with the old soldier, because he used to get so drunk. Why, at a public house close at hand, he would spend seven, eight, and ten shillings on a night, three or four days together. He used to gather so many blackguards round the crossing, they were forced to move him at last. A young man has got it now. He has had it three year. He's not always here, sometimes away for a week at a stretch. But you see, he knows the best times to come, and then he is sure to be here. The little boys come with their brooms now and then, but the police always drive them away. End of section 89section 90 of london labour and the london poor volume 2 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry 3 the able-bodied irish crossing sweeper the old irish crossing sweeper this man a native of county cork has been in england only two years and a half he wears a close-fitting black cloth cap over a shock of reddish hair Round his neck he has a coloured cotton kerchief, of the sort advertised as imitation silk. His black coat is much torn, and his broom is at present remarkably stumpy. He waits quietly at the post opposite St. Blank's Church, to receive whatever is offered him. He is unassuming enough in his manner, and, as will be seen, not even bearing any malice against his two enemies, the sweet stuff man and the Switzer. He says, I've been at this crossing near upon two year. When I first came over to England, about two years and a half ago, I went to haymaking, but you see, I couldn't get any work. And after tramping about a good bit, why my eyesight getting very weak, and I not knowing what to do, I took this crossing. How did I get it? Well, sir, I went walking about and saw it, and nobody on it. So one morning I brought a broom with me, and stood here. Yes, sir, I was interfered with. The man with one arm, a switzer, they calls him. He had had the crossing on Sundays for a long while gone, and he didn't like my being here at all at all. B blank Y, Irish, he used to call me, and other scandalising names. And he and the sweet stuff man opposite, who was a friend of his, tried everything they could to get me off the crossing. But sure I never harmed them at all at all. Yes, sir, I have my regular customers. There's Mr. Blank, he's gone to Sydenham. He's very kind, sir. He gives me a shilling a month. He left word with the servant while he's away to give me a shilling on the first day in every month. He gave me a letter to the eye hospital in Golden Square because of my weakness and my eyesight. But they'll never cure it at all at all, sir, for weak eyes runs in my family. My sister, sir, has weak eyes. She is working at Croydon. Oh, no, indeed, and it isn't the gentlefolks that try to get me off the crossing. They'd rather support me, sir, but the poor people it is that don't like me. Eighteen pence I've made in a day, and more, never more than two shillings, and sometimes not sixpence. Well, sir, I am not like the others. I don't run after the ladies and gentlemen. I don't persevere. Yesterday I took sixpence by chance for taking good luggage for a lady. The day before yesterday I took three halfpence, but I think I got something else for a bit of work then. Yes, winter is better than summer. I don't know which people is the most liberal. Sure, sir, I don't think there's much difference. Oh, yes, their young men are very liberal sometimes, and so are young ladies. 
Perhaps old ladies or old gentlemen give the most at a time, sometimes sixpence, perhaps more. But then, sir, you don't get anything else for a long time. The boy sweepers annoy me very much indeed. They use such scandalising words to me, and throw dirt they do. They know when the police is out of the way, so I get no protection. Sure, sir, and I think it right that every person should attend the worship to which he belongs. I am a Catholic, sir, and attend Mass at St. Patrick's, near St. Giles's, every Sunday, and I try to be its confession once a month. When first I took to the crossing, I was rather irregular, but that was because of the Switzerman. That's the man with the one arm. He used to say he would lock me up and everything, but I have been regular since. I come in the morning, just before eight, in time to catch the gentlefolks going into prayers, and I leave at half-past seven to eight at night. I wait so late because I have to bring a gentleman water for his flowers, and that I do the last thing. I live, sir, in Blank Lane, behind St. Giles's Church, in the first floor front, sir, and I pay one and threepence a week. There are three bids in the room. In one bid, a man, his wife, his mother, and their little girl, Julia, they call her, sleep. In the other bid, there's a man and his wife and child. Yes, I am single and have the third bid to myself. I come from County Cork. The others in the room are all Irish and come from County Cork, too. They sell fruit in the street. In the winter, they sell onions and sometimes oranges. There's a Scotch gentleman as brings me my breakfast every morning. Indeed, yes, and he brings it himself, he does. He has gone to Scotland now, but he will be back in a week. He brings me some bread and meat, and a penny for a half pint of beer, sir. He has done it almost all the time I have been here. The Switzer man, sir, took out boards for the Polytechner, or some place like that. He got fifteen shillings a week, and used to come here on Sundays. Yes, sir, I come here on Sundays, but it is not better than other days. Some people says to me they would rather I went to church, but I tells them I do. And sure, sir, after Mass, there's no harm in a little sweeping between whiles. No, sir, there's not a crossing sweeper in old Ireland. Well, sir, I never was in Dublin, but I've been in Cork, sir, and they don't have any crossing sweepers there. When I get home of a night, sir, I am very tired, but I always offer up my devotions before sleeping. Ah, sir, I should never have swept crossings if a friend of mine hadn't died. He was collector of tolls in Clarny Kilts, and I used to be with him. He lost his situation, and so I came to England. The Switzer man, I think he used to sweep at eight o'clock, just as the people were going to prayers. Oh, sir, he was always black guyard me. Go back to your own country, says he. A furner himself, too. Well, yes, sir, I do wish for bad weather. A good wit day and a dry day after is the best. Sure, and they can't turn me off my crossing only for my bad conduct, and I try to be quiet and take no notice. Yes, sir, I have always been a churchgoer, and I am seventy-five. I used to have some good regular customers, but somehow I haven't seen anything of them for this last twelve month. Ah, it's in the better neighbourhoods that people give regularly. I never get any broken victuals. Three and sixpence is the outside of my earnings, taken one week with the other. What is the last I ever took? Well, sir, for three days I haven't taken a farthing. The worst week I ever had was thirteen or fourteen pence altogether. The best week I ever had was the winter before last. That hard winter, sir. I remember taking seven shillings then. But the man at Portman Square makes the most. Well, sir, I believe there's some of every nation in the world as sweeps crossings in London. The Female Irish Crossing Sweeper In a street not far from Gordon Square and the New Road, I found this poor old woman resting from her daily labour. She was sitting on the stone ledge of the iron railings at the corner of the street, huddled up in the way seemingly natural to old Irish women, her broom hidden as much as possible under her petticoats. Her shawl was as tidy as possible for its age. She was sixty-seven years and had buried two husbands and five children, fractured her ribs and injured her groin, and had nothing left to comfort her but her crossing, her haperth of snuff, and her drop of biled water by which name she indicated her tay. She was very civil and intelligent, and answered my inquiries very readily, and with rather less circumlocution than the Irish generally display. She seemed much hurt at the closing of the old St. Pancras churchyard. They buried my child where they'll never bury me, sir, she cried. She told the story of her accident with many involuntary movements of her hand towards the injured part and took a sparing pinch of snuff from a little black snuff-box, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, for which she said she had given a penny. 
She proceeded thus. I'm an Irish woman, sir, and it's from Kinsale I come, twelve miles beyond Kirk, to the left-hand side, a seaport town, and a great place for fish. It's fifty years the sixteenth of last June since I came in St. Giles's parish, and there my eldest child went dead. Buried she is in old St. Pancras churchyard, where they'll never bury me, sir, for they've done away with burying in churchyards. That girl was forty-one years of age the seventeenth of last February, born in Stratford, below Bow in Essex. Ah, I was comfortable there. I lived there three year and abouts. I was in service at Mr. Blank's, a French gentleman he was, and kept a school where they taught French and English both. But I dare say they are all gone dead years ago. He was a very old gentleman, and so was his lady. She was a North of England lady, but very stout, and had no children but a son and a daughter. I was quite young when my aunt brought me over. My uncle was three year here before my aunt, and he died at Whitechapel. I was bechuxed sixteen and seventeen when I come over, and I reckon myself at sixty-seven come next Christmas, as well as I can guess. I never had a mother, sir. She died when I was only six months old. My father, sir, was maltster to Mr. Walker, the distiller, in Cork. Ah, indeed, and my father was well to do once. Early or late, wit or dry, he had a guinea a week, but he worked day and night. He was to attend to the corn, and he would have four men, or five or six, under him, according as busy they might be. My father has been dead four and twenty year, and I wouldn't know a crater if I went home. Father come over, sir, and wanted me to go back very bad, but I wouldn't. I was married then, and had buried some of my children in St. Pancras, and for what should I leave England? Oh, sir, I buried three and eight months, two sons and their father. My husband was two year and ten months keeping his bed. He has been dead fifteen years to the eighth of last March, but I've been married again. Seven children I've had, and only two alive, and they've got enough to do to manage for themselves. The boy, he follows the market, and my daughter, she is along with her husband. Sure, he sills in the street, sir. I see very little of her. She lives over in the borough. I think I'll be after going down to Kent, be Aunt Maidstone, a hop-picking, if I can get as much as to take me down the road. My daughter's husband and me don't agree, so I'm bitter not to see them. Every day, sir, every day in the week I am here. This morning I was here at eight. That was earlier than usual, but I came out because I had not broke my fast with anything but a drop of water, and that I had two tumblers off it from the house at the corner. I intend to go home and take two herons, and have a drop of biled water. Tea, I mean, sir. I come here at about half-past nine to half-past ten, but I'm getting a very bad leg. I goes home about five or six. I have taken two halfpennies this morning, threepence I took yesterday. The day before I took, I think, fourpence halfpenny. That was my taking on Monday. On Sunday I mustered a shilling. On Saturday, I declare, sir, I forget, fourpence or threepence, I suppose, but my friends is out of town very much. They gives me a penny regular every Sunday, or a halfpenny, and sometimes twopence. Of a Sunday in the good time, I may take eighteen pence or sixteen pence. Oh yes, of Christmas it's better it is, four or five shillings on a Christmas day. On the Monday fortnight, before last Christmas twelve month, I had two ribs broke, and one fractured, and my grind bone, note, groin, end note, injured. Oh, the pains that I feel even now, sir. I lived then in Phillips Gardens, up there in the new road. The policeman took me to the hospital. It was eighteen days I never got off my bed. I came out in the morning of the Christmas Eve. I held on by the railings as I went along, and I thought I never should get home. How I was knocked down was by a cart. I had my eye bad then, the lift one, and had a cloth over it. I was just coming out of the archway of the court, close by the beer shop, away from Mr. Blank's house, when crossing to the greengrocer's to get two pound of praties for my supper, and I didn't see the cart coming. I was knocked down by the shaft. They called and they called, and he wouldn't stop, and it went over me it did. It was loaded with cloth. I don't know if it wasn't a schoolbred's cart, but the boy said to the hospital doctor and to the policeman it was heavily loaded. The boy gave me a shilling, and that was all the money I received. For a twelvemonth I couldn't hardly walk. On that Christmas day I took four and tenpence, but I owed it all for renting things, and I'm sure it's a good man that let me run at the score. Is it a shilling I ever get? Well then, sir, there's one gentleman, but he's out of town. Sir George Hewitt never passes without giving me a shilling. I have taken one and ninepence on a Sunday, and I've taken two shillings. Upon my soul, I've often gone home with three halfpence and twopence. 
for this month past put every day together, I haven't taken three shilling a week. I wear two brooms out in a week in bad weather, and then perhaps I take four to five shilling, Sunday included. But for the three years since here I've been on this crossin', I never took ten shilling, sir, never. Yes, there was a man here before me. He had bad eyes, and he was obligated to leave and go into the workhouse. He lost the sight of one of his eyes when he came back again. I knew him sweeping here a long time. When he come back, I said, Father, says I, I went on your crossing. Ah, says he, you've got a bad crossing, poor woman. I wouldn't go on it again, I wouldn't. And I never seen him since. I don't know whether he is living or not. A wit day makes fourpence or fippence difference sometimes. Indeed, I have heard of crossing sweepers making so much and so much. I hear people talking about it. But for my part, I wouldn't give heed to what they say. In Oxford Street, towards the parrocks, there was a man years ago, they say, by all accounts, left a dale of money. I am never annoyed by boys. I don't speak to none of them. I was in service till I got married. Then I used to sell fruit through Kentish Town, Highgate and Hampstead, but I never sold in the street, sir, and had my regular customers like any greengrocer. I had a good connection I had, but by getting old and feeble and sick and not being able to go about, I was forced to give it up, I was. I couldn't carry twelve pound upon my head. No, not if I was to get a sovereign a day for it now. I never leave the crossing. I haven't got a friend, nor a day's pleasure I never take. Oh, yes, sir, I must have a pinch. This is my snuff-box. I take a haperth a day, and that's the only comfort I've got. That and a cup of tea, where I can't drink cocoa or coffee tea. My feeding is a bit of bread and butter. I haven't bought a bit of meat these three months. I used to get two pennorth of bones and mate at Mrs. Baker's down there, but mate is so dear that they don't have em now, and it's a shame I am of bothering them so often. I frequently have a herring. Oh dear no, sir, water is my drink. I can't afford no beer. Sometimes I have a pennorth of gin and cold water, and I find it do me a world of good. Sometimes I get enough to eat, but lately indeed I can't get that. I declare I don't know which people give the most. The gentlemen give me more in wet weather, for then the ladies, you see, can't let their dresses out of their hands. I am a Catholic, sir. I go to St. Patrick's sometimes, or I go to Gordon Street Church. I don't care which I go to. It's all the same to me. But I haven't been to church for months. I've nothing to charge myself with. And indeed, I haven't been to confession for some year. Trades people are very kind, indeed they are. Yes, I think I'll go to Kinter Hop Picking, and as for my crossing, I leave it, sir, just as it is. I go five miles beyond Maidstone. I worked fifteen years at Mr. Blank. He was a pole puller and binsman in the hop ground. I've not been down there since the year before last. I was too poorly after that accident. We make about eighteen pence, two shillings or one shilling. Gordon has the hops as good. No lodging nor fire to pay, and we get plenty of good milk chap there. I manage then to save a little money to help us in the winter. I live in Blank Street, Seven Dials, but I'm going to leave my son. We can't agree. We live in the two pair back. I pay nothing a week, only bring home every halfpenny to help them. Sometimes I spend a penny or tuppence out on myself. My son is doing very badly. He sells fruit in the streets, but he's never been used to it before, and he has pains in his limbs with so much walking. He has no connection, and with the strawberries now, he's forced to walk about of a night as well as a day, for they won't keep till the morning. They all go mouldy and bad. My son has been used to the brick lane, sir. He can lit in a stove or a copper, or do a bit of plaster or lath or the like. His wife is a very just, clean, sober woman, and he has got three good children. There is Catherine, who is named after me. She is nearly five. Ellen, two years and six months, named after her mother and Margaret, the baby, six months old, and she is called after my daughter, who is dead. 4. The Occasional Crossing Sweepers The Sunday Crossing Sweeper I'm a Sunday Crossing Sweeper, said an oyster stall keeper, in answer to my inquiries. I mean by that, I only sweep a crossing on a Sunday. I pitch in the Lorimer Road, Newington, with a few oysters on weekdays, and I does jobs for the people about there, such as cleaning a few knives and forks, or shoes and boots and windows. I've been in the habit of sweeping a crossing about four or five years. I never knowed my father. He died when I was a baby. He was a interpreter and spoke seven different languages. My father used to go with Bonaparte's army and used to interpret for him. 
He died in the south of France. I had a brother, but he died quite a child, and my mother supported me and a sister by being cook in a gentleman's family. We was put out to nurse. My mother couldn't afford to put me to school, and so I can't read nor write. I'm forty-one years old. The first work I ever did was being boy at a pork butcher's. I used to take out the meat what was ordered. At last my master got broke up, and I was discharged from my place, and I took to selling a few sprats. I had no thoughts of taking to a crossing then. I was ten year old. I remember I gave two shillings for a shallow. That's a flat basket with two handles. They put em atop of well baskets, them as can carry a good load. A well basket's almost like a coffin. It's a long and like a shallow, only it's a good deal deeper, about as deep as a washing tub. I done very fair with my sprats, till they got dear, and come up very small. So then I was obliged to get a few place, and then I got a few baked taters and sold them. I hadn't money enough to buy a tin. I could have got one for eight shillings. So I put em in a cross-handle basket and carried em round the streets and into public houses and cried, Bake taters, all hot. I used only to do this of a night, and it brought me about four or five shillings a week. I used to fill up the day by going round to gentlemen's houses where I was known to run for errands and clean knives and boots, and that brought me such a thing as four shillings a week more altogether. I never had no idea then of sweeping a crossing of a Sunday, but at last I was obliged to push to it. I kept on like this for many years, and at last a gentleman named Mr. Jackson promised to buy me a tin, but he died. My mother went blind through a blight. That was the cause of my first going out to work, and so I had to keep her. But I didn't mind that. I thought it was my duty so to do. About ten years ago, I got married. My wife used to go out washing and ironing. I thought two of us would get on better than one, and she didn't mind helping me to keep my mother for I was determined my mother shouldn't go into the workhouse so long as I could help it. A year or two after I got married, I found I must do something more to help to keep home, and then I first thought of sweeping a crossing on Sundays, so I bought a heath broom for Tuppence Halfpenny, and I pitched again the Canterbury Arms, Kennington. It was between a baker's shop and a public house and butcher's. They told me they'd all give me something if I'd sweep the crossing regular. The best places is in front of chapels and churches, "'cause you can take more money in front of a church or a chapel "'than what you can in a private road, "'cause they look at it more, "'and a good many thinks when you sweeps in front of a public house "'that you go and spend your money inside in waste. "'The first Sunday I went at it, I took eighteen pence. "'I began at nine o'clock in the morning "'and stopped till four in the afternoon. "'The publican give fourpence, "'and the baker sixpence, and the butcher threepence, "'so that altogether I got above a half crown. "'I stopped at this crossing a year,' and I always knocked up about two shillings or a half crown on the Sunday. I very seldom got anything from the ladies. It was most all give by the gentlemen. Little children used sometimes to give me halfpence, but it was when their father give it to him. The little children liked to do that sort of thing. The way I come to leave this crossing was this here. The road was being repaired, and they shot down a lot of stones, so then I couldn't sweep no crossing. I looked out for another place, and I went opposite the Duke of Sutherland's public house in the Lorrimore Road. I swept there one Sunday, and I got about one and sixpence. While I was sweeping this crossing, a gentleman comes up to me, and he asks me if I ever goes to chapel or church, and I tells him, yes, I goes to church what I'd been brought up to. And then he says, you let me see you at St. Michael's Church, Brixton, and I'll courage you, and you'll do better if you come up and sweep in front there of a Sunday, instead of where you are. You'll be sure to get more money, and be better couraged. It don't matter what you do, he says, as long as it brings you in an honest crust. Anything's better than thieving. And then the gent gives me sixpence and goes away. As soon as he'd gone, I started off to his church and got there just after the people was all in. I left my room in the churchyard. When I got inside the church, I could see him a-sitting just agin the communion table. So I walks to the free seats and sits down right close agin the communion table myself, for his pew was on my right, and he saw me directly and looked and smiled at me. As he was coming out of the church, he says, says he, As long as I live, if you comes here on a Sunday regular, I shall always courage you. The next Sunday I went up to the church and swept the crossing, and he sees me there, but he didn't give me nothing till the church was over, and then he gave me a shilling, and the other people give me about one and sixpence, so I got about two and sixpence altogether, and I thought that was a good beginning. The next Sunday the gentleman was ill, but he didn't forget me. He sent me sixpence by his servant, and I got from the other people about two shillings more. I never see that gentleman after, for he died on the Saturday. His wife sent for me on the Sunday. She was ill abed, 
and I see one of the daughters, and she gave me sixpence, and said I was to be there on Monday morning. I went on the Monday, and the lady was much worse, and I see the daughter again. She gave me a couple of shirts, and told me to come on the Friday, and when I went on that day, I found the old lady was dead. The daughter gave me a coat and trousers and waistcoat. After the daughters had buried the father and mother, they moved. I kept on sweeping at the church, till at last things got so bad that I come away, for nobody give me nothing. The houses about there was so damp that people wouldn't live in them. So then I come up into Lorimer Road, and there I've been ever since. I don't get on wonderful well there. Sometimes I don't get above sixpence all day, but it's mostly a shilling or so. The most I've took is about one and sixpence. The reason why I stop there is because I'm known there, you see. I stand there all the week selling heisters, and the people about there give me a good many jobs. Besides, the road is rather bad there, and they like to have a clean crossing of a Sunday. I don't get any more money in the winter, though it's muddier, than I do in the summer. The reason is because there isn't so many people stirring about in the winter as there is in the summer. One broom will carry me over three Sundays, and I gives tuppence halfpenny a piece for him. Sometimes the people bring me out at my crossing, especially in cold weather, a mug of hot tea and some bread and butter, or a bit of meat. I don't know any other crossing sweeper. I never associates with nobody. I always keeps my own counsel, and likes my own company the best. My wife's been dead five months, and my mother six months, but I've got a little boy seven year old. He stops at school all day till I go home at night, and then I fetches him home. I mean to do something better with him than give him a broom. A good many people would set him on a crossing, but I mean to keep him at school. I want to see him read and write well, because he'll suit for a place then. There's some art in sweeping a crossing even. That is, you mustn't sweep too hard, because if you do, you wears a hole right in the road, and then the water hangs in it. It's the same as sweeping a path. If you sweeps too hard, you wears up the stones. To do it properly, you must put the end of the broom handle in the palm of your right hand, and lay hold of it with your left. Your left, about half way down. Then you takes half your crossing, and sweeps on one side, till you gets over the road. Then you turns round and comes back doing the other half. Some people holds the broom before em, and keeps swaying it backwards and forwards to sweep the width of the crossing all in one stroke. But that ain't such a good plan, cause you're apt to splash people that's coming by. And besides, it wears the road in holes, and wears out the broom so quick. I always use my broom steady. I never splash nobody. I never tried myself, but I've seen some crossing sweepers as could do all manner of things in mud, such as diamonds and stars and the moon and letters of the alphabet. And once in Oxford Street, I see our saviour on his cross in mud, and it was done well too. The figure wasn't done with the broom, it was done with a pointed piece of stick. It was a boy as I seen doing it, about fifteen. He didn't seem to take much money while I was a-looking at him. I don't think I should a took to crossing sweeping if I hadn't got married. But when I'd got a couple of children, for I've had a girl die, if she'd lived, she'd have been eight years old now. I found I must do a something, and so I took to the broom. End of section 90section 91 of london labour and the london poor volume 2 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry b the afflicted crossing sweepers the wooden-legged sweeper this man lives up a little court running out of a wide second-rate street it is a small court consisting of some half dozen houses all of them what are called by courtesy private I inquired at number three for John Blank. The first floor back, if you please, sir. And to the first floor back I went. Here I was answered by a good-looking and intelligent young woman with a baby, who said her husband had not yet come home, but would I walk in and wait. I did so, and found myself in a very small, close room, with a little furniture, which the man called his few sticks, and presently discovered another child, a little girl, the girl was very shy in her manner, being only two years and two months old, and, as her mother said, very ailing from the difficulty of cutting her teeth, though the true cause seemed to be want of proper nourishment and fresh air. The baby was a boy, a fine, cheerful, good-tempered little fellow, but rather pale, and with an unnaturally large forehead. The mantelpiece of the room was filled with little ornaments of various sorts, such as bead-baskets, 
and over them hung a series of black profiles, not portraits of either the crossing sweeper or any of his family, but an odd lot of heads, which had lost their owners many a year, and served, in company with a little red, green and yellow scripture piece, to keep the wall from looking bare. Over the door, inside the room, was nailed a horseshoe, which, the wife told me, had been put there by her husband for luck. A bed, two deal tables, a couple of boxes and three chairs formed the entire furniture of the room and nearly filled it. On the window frame was hung a small shaving glass, and on the two boxes stood a wickerwork apology for a perambulator, in which I learnt the poor crippled man took out his only daughter at half-past four in the morning. "'If some people was to see that, sir,' said the sweeper, when he entered and saw me looking at it, they would, and in fact they do, say, why, you can't be in want. Ah, little they know how we starved and pinched ourselves before we could get it. There was a fire in the room, notwithstanding the day was very hot, but the window was wide open and the place tolerably ventilated, though oppressive. I have been in many poor people's places, but never remember one so poor in its appointments, and yet so free from effluvia. The crossing sweeper himself was a very civil sort of man, and in answer to my inquiries said, I know that I do as I ought to, and so I don't feel hurt at standing at my crossing. I have been there four years. I found the place vacant. My wife, though she looks very well, will never be able to do any hard work. So we sold our mangle, and I took to the crossing. But we're not in debt, and nobody can't say nothing to us. I like to go along the streets free of such remarks as is made by people to whom you owe money. I had a mangle in blank yard, but through my wife's weakness I was forced to part with it. I was on the crossing a short time before that, for I knew that if I parted with my mangle and things before I knew whether I could get a living at the crossing, I couldn't get my mangle back again. We sold the mangle only for a sovereign, and we gave two pound ten for it. We sold it to the same man that we bought it off. About six months ago, I managed for to screw and save enough to buy that little wicker chase, for I can't carry the children because of my one leg, and of course the mother can't carry them both out together. There was a man had the crossing I've got. He died three or four years before I took it. But he didn't depend on the crossing. He did things for the tradespeople about, such as carpet beating, messages and so on. When I first took the crossing, I did very well. It happened to be a very nasty, dirty season, and I took a good deal of money. Sweepers are not always civil, sir. I wish I had gone to one of the squares, though. But I think after Blank Street is paved with stone, I shall do better. I am certain I never taste a bit of meat from one week's end to the other. The best day I ever made was five and sixpence, or six shillings. It was the winter before last. If you remember, the snow laid very thick on the ground, and the sudden thaw made walking so uncomfortable that I did very well. I have taken as little as sixpence, fourpence, and even tuppence. Last Thursday I took two halfpence all day. Take one week with the other, seven or eight shillings is the very outside. I don't know how it is, but some people who used to give me a penny don't now. The boys who come in wet weather earn a great deal more than I do. I once lost a good chance, sir, at the corner of the street leading to Cavendish Square. There's a bank, and they pay a man seven shillings a week to sweep the crossing. A butcher in Oxford Market spoke for me, but when I went up, it unfortunately turned out that I was not fit from the loss of my leg. The last man they had there, they were obliged to turn away. He was so given to drink. I think there are some rich crossing sweepers in the city, about the exchange, but you won't find them now during this dry weather, except in by places. In wet weather, there are two or three boys who sweep near my crossing and take all my earnings away. There's a great able-bodied man besides, a fellow strong enough to follow the plough. I said to the policeman, now ain't this a shame? And the policeman said, well, he must get his living as well as you. I'm always civil to the police, and they're always civil to me. In fact, I think sometimes I'm too civil. I'm not rough enough with people. You soon tell whether to have any hopes of people coming across. I can tell a gentleman directly I see him. Where I stand, sir, I could get people in trouble everlasting. There's all sorts of thieving going on. I saw the other day two or three respectable persons take a purse out of an old lady's pocket before the baker's shop at the corner. But I can't say a word, or they would come and throw me into the road. If a gentleman gives me sixpence, he don't give me any more for three weeks or a month. 
but I don't think I've more than three or four gentlemen as gives me that. Well, you can scarcely tell the gentleman from the clerk. The clerks are such great swells now. Lawyers themselves dress very plain. Those great men who don't come every day, because they have clerks to do their business for them, they give most. People hardly ever stop to speak, unless it is to ask you where places are. You might be occupied at that all day. I manage to pay my rent out of what I take on Sunday, but not lately. This where the religious people go pleasuring. No, I don't go now. The fact is, I'd like to go to church if I could, but when I come home I am tired. But I've got books here, and they do as well, sir. I read a little and write a little. I lost my leg through a swelling. There was no chloroform then. I was in the hospital three years and a half, and was about fifteen or sixteen when I had it off. I always feel the sensation of the foot, and more so at change of weather. I feel my toes moving about and everything. Sometimes it's just as if the calf of my leg was itching. I feel the rain coming. When I see a cloud coming, my leg shoots, and I know we shall have rain. My mother was a laundress. My father has been dead nineteen years my last birthday. My mother was subject to fits, so I was forced to stop at home to take care of the business. I don't want to get on better, but I always think if sickness or anything comes on. I am at my crossing at half past eight. At half past eleven I come home to dinner. I go back at one or two till seven. Sometimes I mind horses and carts, but the boys get all that business. One of these little customers got sixpence the other day for only opening the door of a cab. I don't know how it is they let these little boys be about. If I was the police, I wouldn't allow it. I think it's a blessing having children. Note, referring to his little girl. End note. That child wants the gravy of meat or an egg beaten up, but she can't get it. I take her out every morning round Euston Square and those open places. I get out about half past four. It is early, but if it benefits her, that's no odds. One legged sweeper at Chancery Lane. I don't know what induced me to take that crossing, except it was that no one was there and the traffic was so good. Fact is, the traffic is too good and people won't stop as they cross over. They're very glad to get out of the way of the cabs and the omnibuses. Tradespeople never give me anything, not even a bit of bread. The only thing I get is a few cuttings, such as crusts of sandwiches and remains of cheese, from the public house at the corner of the court. The tradespeople are as distant to me now as they were when I came, but if I should pitch up a tail, I should soon get acquainted with them. We have lived in this lodging two years and a half, and we pay one and ninepence a week, as you may see from the rent book, and that I manage to earn on Sundays. We owe four weeks now, and thank God it's no more. I was born, sir, in Blank Street, Berkeley Square, at Lord Blank's house, when my mother was minding the house. I've been used to London all my life, but not to this part. I've always been at the West End, which is what I call the best end. I did not like the idea of crossing sweeping at first, till I reasoned with myself, why should I mind? I'm not doing any hurt to anybody. I don't care at all now. I know I'm doing what I ought to do. A man had better be killed out of the way than be disabled. It's not pleasant to know that my wife is suckling that great child, and though she is so weakly, she can't get no meat. I've been knocked down twice, sir, both times by cabs. The last time it was a fortnight before I could get about comfortably again. The fool of a fellow was coming along, not looking at his horse, but talking to somebody on the cab rank. The place was as free as this room, if he had only been looking before him. Nobody hollered till I was down, but plenty hollered then. Ah, I often notice such carelessness. It's really shameful. I don't think those shuffles, note, handsomes, end note, should be allowed. The fact is, if the driver is not a tall man, he can't see the horse's head. A nasty place is end of Blank Street. It narrows so suddenly. There's more confusion and more bother about it than any place in London. When two cabs get in at once, one one way and one the other, there's sure to be a row to know which was the first in. The most severely afflicted of all the crossing sweepers. Passing the dreary portico of the Queen's Theatre and turning to the right down Topnam Mews, we came upon a flight of steps leading up to what is called the gallery, where an old man, gasping from the effects of a lung disease and feebly polishing some old harness, proclaimed himself the father of the sweeper I was in search of and ushered me into the room where he lay abed, having had a very bad night. The room itself was large and of a low pitch, stretching over some stables. It was very old and creaky, 
the sweeper called it an old wilderness and contained in addition to two turn-up bedsteads that curious medley of articles which in the course of years an old and poor couple always managed to gather up there was a large lithograph of a horse dear to the remembrance of the old man from an indication of a dog in the corner the very spit of the one i had for years it's a real portrait sir for mr hanbart the printer met me one day and sketched him there was an etching of hogarth's in a black frame a stuffed bird in a wooden case with a glass before it a piece of painted glass hanging in a place of honour but for which no name could be remembered excepting that it was of the old-fashioned sort there were the odd remnants too of old china ornaments but very little furniture and finally a kitten the father worn out and consumptive had been groomed to lord cumbermere i was with him sir when he took bonaparte's house at malmaison i could have had a pension then if i'd a liked but i was young and foolish and had plenty of money and we never know what we may come to the sweeper although a middle-aged man had all the appearance of a boy his raw-looking eyes which he was always wiping with a piece of linen rag gave him a forbidding expression which his shapeless short bridgeless nose tended to increase but his manners and habits were as simple in their character as those of a child and he spoke of his father's being angry with him for not getting up before as if he were a little boy talking of his nurse he walks with great difficulty by the help of a crutch and the sight of his weak eyes his withered limb and his broken shoulder his old helpless mother and his gasping almost inaudible father form a most painful subject for compassion the crossing sweeper gave me with no little meekness and some slight intelligence the following statement i very seldom go out on a crossing of sundays i didn't do much good at it i used to go to church of a sunday in fact i do now when i'm well enough it's fifteen year next january since i left regent street i was there three years and then i went on sundays occasionally sometimes i used to get a shilling but i have given it up now it didn't answer besides a lady who was kind to me found me out and said she wouldn't do any more for me if i went out on sundays she's been dead these three or four years now when i was at regent street i might have made twelve shillings a week or something thereabout i am seven and thirty the twenty-sixth day of last month and i have been lame six and twenty years my eyes have been bad ever since my birth the scrofulous disease it was that lamed me it come with a swelling on the knee and the outside wound broke about the size of a crown piece and a piece of bone come from it then it gathered in the inside and at the top i didn't go into the hospital then but i was an outpatient for the doctor said a close confined place wouldn't do me no good he said that the seaside would though but my parents couldn't afford to send me and that's how it is i did go to brighton and margate nine years after my leg was bad but it was too late then i have been in middlesex hospital with a broken collar-bone when i was knocked down by a cab i was in a fortnight there and i was in again when i hurt my leg i was sweeping my crossing when the top came off my crutch i fell backwards and my leg doubled under me they had to carry me there i went into the middlesex hospital for my eyes and leg i was in a month but they couldn't keep me long there's no cure for me my leg is very painful especially at change of weather sometimes i don't get an hour's sleep of a night it was daylight this morning before i closed my eyes i went on the crossing first because my parents couldn't keep me not being able to keep theirselves i thought it was the best thing i could do but it's like all other things it's got very bad now i used to manage to rub along at first the streets have got shocking bad of late to tell the truth i was turned away from regent street by mr cook the furrier corner of argyle street i'll tell you as far as i was told he called me into his passage one night and said i must look out for another crossing for a lady who was a very good customer of his refused to come while i was there my heavy afflictions was such that she didn't like the look of me i said very well but because i come there next day and the day after that he got the policeman to turn me away certainly the policeman acted very kindly but he said the gentleman wanted me removed and i must find another crossing then i went down charlotte street opposite percy chapel at the corner of windmill street after that i went to wells street by getting permission of the doctor at the corner he thought that it would be better for me than charlotte street so he let me come 
Ah ! there ain't so many crossing sweepers as there was ; I think they've done away with a great many of them. ** When I first went to Wells street I did pretty well, because there was a dressmaker's at the comer, and I used to get a good deal from the carriages that stopped before the door. I used to take five or six shillings in a day then, and I don't take so much in a week now. ** I tell you what I made this week — I've made one and fourpence ; but it's been so wet, and people are out of town ; but of course it's not always alike — sometimes I get three and sixpence, or four shillings. Some people gives me a sixpence or a fourpenny bit — I reckons that all in. ** I am dreadful tired when I comes home of a night. Thank God my other leg's all right. I wish the t'other was as strong, but it never will be now. The police never try to turn me away ; they're very friendly. They'll pass the time of day with me or that, from knowing me so long in Oxford Street. ** My broom sometimes serves me a month. Of course, they don't last long now it's showery weather. I give tuppence halfpenny a piece for em, or thruppence. I don't know who gives me the most. My eyes are so bad I can't see. I think, though, upon an average, the gentlemen give most. Often I hear the children, as they are going by, ask their mothers for something to give to me. But they only say, come along, come along. It's very rare that they lets the children have a halfpenny to give me. My mother is seventy the week before next Christmas. She can't do much now. She does, though, go out on Wednesdays or Saturdays, but that's to people she's known for years who is attached to her. She does her work there just as she likes. Sometimes she gets a little washing, sometimes not. This week she had a little and was forced to dry it indoors, but that makes them half dirty again. My father's breath is so bad that he can't do anything except little odd jobs for people down here, but they've got the knack now, a good many in them, of doing their own. We have lived here fifteen years next September. It's a long time to live in such an old wilderness, but my old mother is a sort of woman as don't like moving about, and I don't like it. Some people are everlasting on the move. When I'm not on my crossing, I sit poking at home or make a job of mending my clothes. I mended these trousers in two or three places. It's all done by feel, sir. My mother says it's a good thing we've got our feeling, at least, if we haven't got our eyesight. The Negro Crossing Sweeper, who had lost both his legs. This man sweeps a crossing in a principal and central thoroughfare when the weather is cold enough to let him walk. The colder the better, he says, as it numbs his stumps like. He is unable to follow this occupation in warm weather as his legs feel just like corns and he cannot walk more than a mile a day. Under these circumstances he takes to begging which he thinks he has a perfect right to do as he has been left destitute in what is to him almost a strange country and has been denied what he terms his rights. He generally sits while begging dressed in a sailor shirt and trousers with a black neckerchief round his neck tied in the usual nautical knot. He places before him the placard which is given beneath, and never moves a muscle for the purpose of soliciting charity. He always appears scrupulously clean. I went to see him at his home early one morning, in fact at half-past eight, but he was not then up. I went again at nine and found him prepared for my visit in a little parlour, in a dirty and rather disreputable alley running out of a court in a street near Brunswick Square. The negro's parlour was scantily furnished with two chairs, a turn-up bedstead, and a sea-chest. A few odds and ends of crockery stood on the sideboard, and a kettle was singing over a cheerful bit of fire. The little man was seated on a chair, with his stumps of legs sticking straight out. He showed some amount of intelligence in answering my questions. We were quite alone, for he sent his wife and child, the former a pleasant-looking half-caste, and the latter, the cheeriest little crowing, smiling piccaninny I have ever seen. He sent them out into the alley while I conversed with himself. His life is embittered by the idea that he has never yet had his rights, that the owners of the ship in which his legs were burnt off have not paid him his wages, of which indeed he says he never received any but the five pounds which he had in advance before starting and that he has been robbed of £42 by a grocer in Glasgow. How true these statements may be, it is almost impossible to say, but from what he says, some injustice seems to have been done him by the canny Scotchman who refuses him his pay, without which he is determined never to leave the country. I was on that crossing, he said, almost the whole of last winter. It was very cold, and I had nothing at all to do, 
So as I passed there, I asked the gentleman at the backer shop, as well as the gentleman at the office, and I asked at the boot shop too, if they would let me sweep there. The policeman wanted to turn me away, but I went to the gentleman inside the office, and he told the policeman to leave me alone. The policeman said first, You must go away. But I said, I couldn't do anything else, and he ought to think it a charity to let me stop. I don't stop in London very long, though, at a time. I go to Glasgow in Scotland, where the owners of the ship in which my legs were burnt off live. I served nine years in the merchant service and the navy. I was born in Kingston in Jamaica. It is an English place, sir, so I am counted as not a foreigner. I am different from them Lascars. I went to sea when I was only nine years old. The owners is in London who had that ship. I was cabin boy, and after I had served my time, I became cook. Or when I couldn't get the place of cook, I went before the mast. I went as head cook in 1851 in the Madeira bark. She used to be a West Indy trader, and to trade out when I belonged to her. We got down to 69 south of Cape Horn, and there we got almost froze and perished to death. That is the book what I sell. The book, as he calls it, consists of eight pages, printed on paper the size of a sheet of note paper. It is entitled, Brief Sketch of the Life of Edward Albert, a native of Kingston, Jamaica, showing the hardships he underwent and the sufferings he endured in having both legs amputated. Hull, W. Howe, Printer. It is embellished with a portrait of a black man, which has evidently been in its time a comic nigger of the Jim Crow tobacco paper kind as is evidenced by the traces of a tobacco pipe, which has been unskilfully erased. The book itself is concocted from an affidavit made by Edward Albert before P. McKinley, Esquire, one of Her Majesty's Justices of the Peace for the Country, so it is printed, of Lanark. I have seen the affidavit, and it is almost identical with the statement in the book, excepting in the matter of grammar, which has rather suffered on its road to Mr. Howe, the printer. The following will give an idea of the matter of which it is composed. Quote, in February 1851, I engaged to serve as cook on board the bark Madeira of Glasgow, Captain J. Douglas, on her voyage from Glasgow to California, thence to China, and thence home to a port of discharge in the United Kingdom. I signed articles and delivered up my register ticket as a British seaman, as required by law. I entered the service on board the said vessel, under the said engagement, and sailed with that vessel on the 18th of February, 1851. I discharged my duty as cook on board the said vessel, from the date of its having left the Clyde until June the same year, in which month the vessel rounded Cape Horn. At that time my legs became frostbitten, and I became in consequence unfit for duty. In the course of the next day after my limbs became affected, the master of the vessel, and mate, took me to the ship's oven, in order, as they said, to cure me. The oven was hot at the time, a fowl that was roasting therein having been removed in order to make room for my feet, which was put into the oven. In consequence of the treatment, my feet burst through the intense swelling, and mortification ensued. The vessel called, six weeks after, at Valparaiso, and I was there taken to a hospital, where I remained five months and a half. Both my legs were amputated three inches below my knees soon after I went to the hospital at Valparaiso. I asked my master for my wages due to me for my service on board the vessel, and demanded my register ticket. When the captain told me I should not recover, that the vessel could not wait for me, and that I was a dead man, and that he could not discharge a dead man, and that he also said that as I had no friends there to get my money, he would only put a little money into the hands of the consul, which would be applied in burying me. On being discharged from the hospital, I called on the consul, and was informed by him that master had not left any money. I was afterwards taken on board one of Her Majesty's ships, the driver, Captain Charles Johnson, and landed at Portsmouth. From thence I got a passage to Glasgow, where I remained three months. Upon supplication to the register office for seamen in London, my register ticket has been forwarded to the Collector of Customs, Glasgow, and he is ready to deliver it to me upon obtaining the authority of the Justices of the Peace, and I recovered the same under the 22nd section of the General Merchant Seamen's Act. Declares I cannot write. Signed, David McKinley, J.P. End quote. 
** The justices having considered the foregoing information and declaration, find that Edward Albert, therein named the last registered ticket, sought to be covered under circumstances which, so far as he was concerned, were unavoidable, and that no fraud was intended or committed by him in reference thereto, therefore authorised the Collector and Comptroller of Customs at the Port of Glasgow to deliver to the said Edward Albert the registered ticket sought to be recovered by him, all in terms of 22nd section of the General Merchant Seamen's Act. Signed, David McKinley, J.P., Glasgow, October 6th, 1852. Register ticket number 512654, age 25 years. End quote. I could make a large book of my sufferings, sir, if I liked, he said, and I will disgrace the owners of that ship as long as they don't give me what they owe me. I will never leave England or Scotland until I get my rights. But they says money makes money, and if I had money, I could get it. If they would only give me what they owe me, I wouldn't ask anybody for a farthing, God knows, sir. I don't know why the master put my feet in the oven. He said to cure me. The agony of pain I was in was such, he said, that it must be done. The loss of my limbs is bad enough, but it's still worse when you can't get what is your rights, nor anything for the sweat that they worked out of me. After I went down to Glasgow for my money, I opened a little coffee house. It was called Uncle Tom's Cabin. I did very well. The man who sold me tea and coffee said he would get me on, and I had better give my money to him to keep safe, and he used to put it away in a tin box which I had given four and sixpence for. He advertised my place in the papers, and I did a good business. I had the place open a month when he kept all my savings, two and forty pounds, and shut up the place and denied me of it, and I never got a farthing. I declare to you, I can't describe the agony I felt when my legs were burst. I fainted away over and over again. There was four men come. I was lying in my hammock, and they moved the fowl that was roasting and put my legs in the oven. There they held me for ten minutes. They said it would take the cold out. But after I came out, the cold caught him again, and the next day they swole up as big round as a pillar and burst, and then like water come out. No man but God knows what I have suffered and went through. By the order of the doctor at Valparaiso, the sick patients had to come out of the rooms I went into. The smell was so bad, I couldn't bear it myself. It was all mortification. They had to use chloride or zinc to keep the smell down. They tried to save one leg, but the mortification was getting up into my body. I got better after my legs were off. I was three months good before I could turn or able to lift up my hand to my head. I was glad to move after that time. It was a regular relief to me. If it wasn't for good attendance, I should not have lived. You know they don't allow tobacco in a hospital, but I had it. It was the only thing I cared for. The Reverend Mr. Armstrong used to bring me a pound a fortnight. He used to bring it regular. I never used to smoke before. They said I never should recover. But after I got the tobacco, it seemed to soothe me. I was five months and a half in that place. Admiral Mosley of the Thetis frigate sent me home. And the reason why he sent me home was that after I came well, I called on Mr. Rouse, the English consul, and he sent me to the boarding house till such time as he could find a ship to send me home in. I was there about two months, and the boarding master, Jan Pace, sent me to the consul. I used to get about a little with two small crutches, and I also had a little cart before that on three wheels. It was made by a man in the hospital. I used to lash myself down in it. That was the best thing I ever had. I could get about best in that. Well, I went to the consul, and when I went to him, he says, I can't pay your board. You must beg and pay for it. So I went and told Jan Pace, and he said, If you had stopped here a hundred years, I would not turn you out. And then I asked Pace to tell me where the admiral lived. What do you want with him, says he. I said, I think the admiral must be higher than the consul. Pace slapped me on the back. Says he, I'm glad to see you've got the pluck to complain to the admiral. I went down at nine o'clock the next morning to see the admiral. He said, well, Prince Albert, how are you getting on? So I told him I was getting on very bad. And then I told him all about the consul. And he said, as long as he stopped, he would see me righted. And took me on board his ship, the Thetis. And he wrote to the consul and said to me, if the consul sends for you, don't you go to him. Tell him you have no legs to walk and he must walk to you. The consul wanted to send me back in a merchant ship, but the admiral wouldn't have it, so I came in the driver, one of Her Majesty's vessels. 
It was the 8th of May, 1852, when I got to Portsmouth. I stopped a little while, about a week, in Portsmouth. I went to the Admiral of the Dockyard, and he told me I must go to the Lord Mayor of London. So I paid my passage to London, saw the Lord Mayor, who sent me to Mr. Yardley, the magistrate, and he advertised the case for me, and I got four pounds fifteen shillings, besides my passage to Glasgow. After I got there, I went to Mr. Symey, a custom house officer. He'd been in the same ship with me to California. He said, Oh, gracious, Edward, how have you lost your limbs? And I burst out a-crying. I told him all about it. He advised me to go to the owner. I went there, but the policeman in London had put my name down as Robert Thorpe, which was the man I lodged with, so they denied me. I went to the shipping office, where they recognised me, and I went to Mr. Symey again, and he told me to go before the Lord Mayor, a Lord Provost they call him in Scotland, and make an affidavit. And so, when they found my story was right, they sent to London for my seaman's ticket, but they couldn't do anything because the captain was not there. When I got back to London, I commenced sweeping the crossing, sir. I only sweep it in the winter because I can't stand in the summer. Oh yes, I feel my feet still. It's just as if I had them sitting on the floor now. I feel my toes moving, like as if I had them. I could count them, the whole ten, whenever I work my knees. I had a corn on one of my toes, and I can feel it still, particularly at the change of weather. Sometimes I might get two shillings a day at my crossing, sometimes one shilling and sixpence. Sometimes I don't take above sixpence. The most I ever made in one day was three shillings and sixpence, but that's very seldom. I am a very steady man. I don't drink what money I get, and if I had the means to get something to do, I'd keep off the streets. When I offered to go to the parish, they told me to go to Scotland, to spite the men who owed me my wages. Many people tell me I ought to go to my country, but I tell them it's very hard. I didn't come here without my legs. I lost them, as it were, in this country. But if I had lost them in my own country, I should have been better off. I should have gone down to the magistrate every Friday and have taken my ten shillings. I went to the Merchant Seamen's Fund, and they said that those who got hurted before 1852 have been getting the funds, but those who were hurted after 1852 couldn't get nothing. It was stopped in 51, and the merchants wouldn't pay any more, and don't pay any more. That's scandalous, because, whether you're willing or not, you must pay two shillings a month. One shilling a month for the hospital fees, and one shilling a month to the Merchant Seamen's Fund, out of your pay. I am married. My wife is the same colour as me, but an Englishwoman. I've been married two years. I married her from where she belonged, in Leeds. I couldn't get on to do anything without her. Sometimes she goes out and sells things, fruit and so on, but she don't make much. With the assistance of my wife, if I could get my money, I would set up in the same line of business as before, in a coffee shop. If I had three pounds, I could do it. It took well in Scotland. I am not a common cook either. I am a pastry cook. I used to make all the sorts of cakes they have in the shops. I bought the shapes and tins and things to make them proper. I'll tell you how I did. There was a kind of apparatus. It boils water and coffee and the milk and the tea in different departments. But you couldn't see the divisions. The pipes all ran into one tap-like. I've had a sixpence and a shilling for people to look at it. It cost me two pound ten. Even if I had a coffee stall down at Covent Garden, I should do. And besides, I understand the making of eel soup. I have one child. It is just three months and a week old. It is a boy, and we call it James Edward Albert. James is after my grandfather, who was a slave. I was a little boy when the slaves in Jamaica got their freedom. The people were very glad to be free. They do better since, I know, because some of them have got property and send their children to school. There's more Christianity there than there is here. The public house is close shut on Saturday night and not open till Monday morning. No fruit is allowed to be sold in the street. I am a Protestant. I don't know the name of the church, but I goes down to a new-built church near King's Cross. I never go in because of my legs, but I just go inside the door. And sometimes when I don't go, I read the testament I've got here. In all my sickness, I took care of that. There are a great many Irish in this place. I would like to get away from it, for it is a very disgraceful place. It is an awful, awful place altogether. I haven't been in it very long, and I want to get out of it. It is not fit. I pay one and sixpence rent. If you don't go out and drink and carouse with them, they don't like it. They make use of bad language. They chaff me about my misfortune. They call me cripple. Some says Uncle Tom, 
and some says nigger, but I never takes no notice of him at all. The following is a verbatim copy of the placard which the poor fellow places before him when he begs. He carries it when not in use in a little calico bag which hangs round his neck. Kind Christian friends, the unfortunate Edward Albert was cook on board the bark Madeira of Glasgow, Captain J. Douglas, in February 1851, when, after rounding Cape Horn, he had his legs and feet frost-bitten, when in that state his master and mate put my legs and feet into the oven, as they said to cure me, the oven being hot at the time. A fowl was roasting was took away to make room for my feet and legs. In consequence of this, my feet and legs swelled and burst. Mortification then ensued, after which my legs were amputated three inches below the knees, soon after my entering the hospital at Valparaiso. As I have no other means to get a livelihood but by appealing to a generous public, your kind donations will be most thankfully received. The Maimed Irish Crossing Sweeper He stands at the corner of Blank Street, where the yellow omnibuses stop, and refers to himself every now and then as the poor lame man. He has no especial mode of addressing the passers-by, except that of hobbling a step or two towards them, and sweeping away an imaginary accumulation of mud. He has lost one leg from the knee by a fall from a scaffold while working as a bricklayer's labourer in Wales some six years ago, and speaks bitterly of the hard time he had of it when he first came to London and hobbled about selling matches. He says he is thirty-six, but looks more than fifty, and his face has the ghastly expression of death. He wears the ordinary close cloth street cap and corduroy trousers. Even during the warm weather, he wears an upper coat, a rough, thick garment, fit for the Arctic regions. It was very difficult to make him understand my object in getting information from him. He thought that he had nothing to tell, and laid great stress upon the fact of his never keeping count of anything. He accounted for his miserably small income by stating that he was an invalid, now and then continually. He said, I can't say how long I have been on this crossing. I think about five years. When I came on it, there had been no one here before. No one interferes with me at all at all. I never heard of a crossing being sold, but I don't know any other sweepers. I makes no freedom with no one, and I always keeps my own mind. I don't know how much I earn a day. Perhaps I might get a shilling and perhaps sixpence. I didn't get much yesterday, Sunday, only sixpence. I was not out on Saturday. I was ill in bed, and I was at home on Friday. Indeed, I did not get much on Thursday, only tuppence halfpenny. The largest day? I don't know. Why? About a shilling. Well, sure, I might get as much as two shillings if I got a shilling from a lady. Some gentlemen are good. Such a gentleman as you now might give me a shilling. Well, as to weather, I likes half dry and half wit. Of course, I wish for the bad weather. Everyone must be glad of what brings good to him. And there's one thing I can't make the weather. I can't make a fine day nor a wit one. I don't think anybody would interfere with me, certainly, if I was a blackyard. I should not be left here, no, nor if I was a thief. But if any other man was to come on to my crossing, I can't say whether the police would interfere to protect me. Perhaps they might. What is it I say to shabby people? Well, by J. Blank. They're all shabby, I think. I don't see any difference. But what can I do? I can't insult them. And I was never insulted myself since here I've been, nor, for the matter of that, ever had an angry word spoken to me. Well, sure, I don't know who's the most liberal. If I got a fourpenny bit from a mall, I'd take it. Some of the ladies are very liberal. A good lady will give me a sixpence. I never heard of sweeping the mud back again. And as for the boys annoying me, I has no colleague in with boys, and they wouldn't be allowed to interfere with me. The police wouldn't allow it. After I came from Wales, where I was on one leg, selling matches, then it was I took to sweeping the crossing. A poor devil must put up with anything, good or bad. Well, I was a labouring man, a bricklayer's labourer and I've been away from Ireland these sixteen year. When I came from Ireland, I went to Wales. I was there a long time, and the way I broke my leg was, I fell off a scaffold. I am not married. A lame man wouldn't get any woman to have him in London at all at all. I don't know what age I am. I'm not fifty, nor forty. I think about thirty-six. No, by J. Blank. It's not myself that ever knew a well-off crossing sweeper. I don't deal in them at all. I got to deal of friends in London assist me but only now and then. If I depended on the few halfpence I get, I wouldn't live on them. What money I get here wouldn't buy a pound a mate. 
and I wouldn't live only for my friends. You see, sir, I can't be out always. I am laid up nows and thins continually. Oh, it's a poor trade to big on the crossing from morning till night and not get sixpence. I couldn't do with it, I know. Yes, sir, I smoke. It's a comfort it is. I like any kind I'd get to smoke. I'd like the best if I got it. I am a Roman Catholic, and I go to St. Patrick's and St. Giles's. A many people from my neighbourhood go there. I go every Sunday, and to confession just once a year. That saves me. By the Lord's mercy, I don't get broken victuals, nor broken mate, not as much as you might put on the tip of a fork. They'd chuck it out in the dustbin before they'd give it to me. I suppose they're all alike. The devil an odd job I ever got, master, nor knives to clean. If I got their knives to clean, perhaps I might clean them. My brooms cost threepence halfpenny. They are very good. I wear them down to a stump, and they last three weeks this fine weather. I never got any old clothes. Not but I want a coat very bad, sir. I come from Dublin. My father and mother died there of cholera, and when they died I come to England, and that was the cause of my coming. By my oath I didn't stand me in more than eighteen pence when I took here last week. I live in Blank Lane, St Giles's Church on the second landing, and I pay eight pence a week. I haven't a room to myself, for there's a family lives in it with me. When I goes home I just smokes a pipe and goes to bed, that's all. End of section 91section ninety two of london labour and the london poor volume two by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry two juvenile crossing sweepers a the boy crossing sweepers boy crossing sweepers and tumblers a remarkably intelligent lad who on being spoken to at once consented to give all the information in his power told me the following story of his life it will be seen from this boy's account and the one or two following that a kind of partnership exists among some of these young sweepers they have associated themselves together appropriated several crossings to their use and appointed a captain over them they have their forms of trial and jury house for the settlement of disputes laws have been framed which govern their commercial proceedings and a kind of language adopted by the society for its better protection from its arch enemy the policeman I found the lad who first gave me an insight into the proceedings of the associated crossing sweepers crouched on the stone steps of a door in Adelaide Street, Strand, and when I spoke to him he was preparing to settle down in a corner and go to sleep, his legs and body being curled round almost as closely as those of a cat on a hearth. The moment he heard my voice he was upon his feet, asking me to give a halfpenny to poor little Jack. He was a good-looking lad, with a pair of large, mild eyes, which he took good care to turn up with an expression of supplication as he moaned for his half-penny. A cap, or more properly, a stuff-bag, covered a crop of hair which had matted itself into the form of so many paint-brushes, while his face, from its roundness of feature and the complexion of dirt, had an almost Indian look about it. The colour of his hands, too, was such that you could imagine he had been shelling walnuts. He ran before me, treading cautiously with his naked feet, until I reached a convenient spot to take down his statement, which was as follows. I've got no mother or father. Mother has been dead for two years, and father's been gone more than that, more nigh five years. He died at Ipswich in Suffolk. He was a perfumer by trade, and used to make hair dye, and scent, and pomatum, and all kinds of scents. He didn't keep a shop himself, but he used to serve them as did. He didn't hawk his goods about, neither but had regular customers, what used to send him a letter, and then he'd take them what they wanted. Yes, he used to serve some good shops. There was H's of London Bridge, what's a large chemist's. He used to make a good deal of money, but he lost it betting. And so his brother, my uncle, did all his. He used to go up to High Park, and then go round by the hospital, and then turn up a yard, where all the men are who play for money. Note, Tattersall's, end note. And there he'd lose his money, or sometimes win but that wasn't often. I remember he used to come home tipsy and say he'd lost on this or that horse, naming what one he'd laid on, and then mother would coax him to bed and afterwards sit down and begin to cry. I was not with father when he died, but I was when he was dying, for I was sent up along with eldest sister to London with a letter to uncle, who was head servant at a doctor's. In this letter, mother asked uncle to pay back some money what he owed and what father lent him. 
and she asked him if he'd like to come down and see father before he died. I recollect I went back again to mother by the Orwell steamer. I was well dressed then, and had good clothes on, and I was given to the care of the captain, Mr. King his name was. But when I got back to Ipswich, father was dead. Mother took on dreadful. She was ill for three months afterwards, confined to her bed. She hardly ate anything, only beef tea, I think they call it, and eggs, all the while she kept on crying. Mother kept a servant. Yes, sir, we always had a servant, as long as I can recollect. And she and the woman as was there, Anna, they called her, an old lady, used to take care of me and sister. Sister was fourteen years old. She's married to a young man now, and they've gone to America. She went from a place in the East India docks, and I saw her off. I used, when I was with mother, to go to school in the morning, and go at nine and come home at twelve to dinner, then go again at two, and leave off at half-past four. That is, if I behaved myself and did all my lessons right, for if I did not, I was kept back till I did them so. Mother used to pay one shilling a week, and extra for the copy-books and things. I can read and write, oh yes, I mean, read and write well, read anything, even old English, and I write pretty fair, though I don't get much reading now, unless it's penny paper. I've got one in my pocket now. It's the London Journal. There's a tale in it now about two brothers, and one of them steals the child away and puts another in his place, and then he gets found out and all that, and he's just been fallen off a bridge now. After mother got better, she sold all the furniture and goods and came up to London. Poor mother. She let a man of the name of Hayes have the greater part, and he left Ipswich soon after, and never gave mother the money. We came up to London, and mother took two rooms in Westminster, and I and sister lived along with her. She used to make hair nets, and sister helped her, and used to take them to the hairdressers to sell. She made these nets for two or three years, though she was suffering with a bad breast. She died of that, poor thing, for she had what doctors calls cancer. Perhaps you've heard of him, sir. And they had to cut all round here, note, making motions with his hands, from the shoulder to the bosom, end note. Sister saw it, though I didn't. Ah, she was a very good, kind mother, and very fond of both of us though father wasn't, for he'd always have a noise with mother when he come home, only he was seldom with us when he was making his goods. After mother died, sister still kept on making nets, and I lived with her for some time, until she told me she couldn't afford to keep me no longer, though she seemed to have a pretty good lot to do. But she would never let me go with her to the shops, though I could crochet, which she'd learned me, and I used to run and get her all the silks and things what she wanted. But she was keeping company with a young man, and one day they went out and came back and said they'd been and got married. It was him as got rid of me. He was kind to me for the first two or three months while he was keeping her company, but before he was married he got a little cross, and after he was married he began to get more cross and used to send me to play in the streets and tell me not to come home again till night. One day he hit me, and I said I wouldn't be hit about by him, and then at tea that night sister gave me three shillings and told me I must go and get my own living. So I bought a box and brushes, they cost me just the money, and went cleaning boots, and I done pretty well with them, till my box was stole from me by a boy where I was lodging. He's in prison now, got six calendar for picking pockets. Sister kept all my clothes. When I asked her for em, she said they was disposed of, along with all mother's goods. But she gave me some shirts and stockings and such like, and I had very good clothes, only they was all worn out. I saw sister after I left her many times. I asked her many times to take me back, but she used to say it was not her likes, but her husband's, and she'd have had me back. And I think it was true, for until he came, she was a kind-hearted girl, but he said he'd enough to do to look after his own living. He was a fancy baker by trade. I was fifteen, the twenty-fourth of last May, sir, and I've been sweeping crossings now near upon two years. There's a party of six of us, and we have the crossings from St. Martin's Church as far as Pall Mall. I always go along with them as lodges in the same place as I do. In the daytime, if it's dry, we do anything what we can, open cabs or anything. But if it's wet, we separate, and I and another gets a crossing. Those who gets on it first keeps it, and we stand on each side and take our chance. We do it in this way. If I was to see two gentlemen coming, I should cry out, Two toffs! And then they are mine. And whether they give me anything or not, they are mine. And my mate is bound not to follow them for if he did, he would get a hiding from the whole lot of us. If we both cry out together, then we share. If it's a lady and gentleman, then we cries, a toff and a doll. Sometimes we are caught out in this way. Perhaps it is a lady and gentleman and a child, and if I was to see them and only say, a toff and a doll, and leave out the child, 
Then my mate can add the child ; and as he is right and I wrong, then it's his party. ** If there's a policeman close at hand, we mustn't ask for money ; but we are always on the look out for the policeman, and if we see one, then we calls out * Philip !' for that's our signal. ** One of the policemen at St. Martin's Church — Bandy we calls him — knows what Philip means, for he's up to us ; so we had to change the word." [At the request of the young crossing sweeper, the present signal is omitted.] ** Yesterday, on the crossing, I got threepence halfpenny ; but when it's dry like to day, I do nothink, for I haven't got a penny yet. We never carries no pockets, for if the policemen find us, we generally pass the money to our mates, for if money's found on us, we have fourteen days in prison. If I was to reckon all the year round, that is, one day with another, I think we make fourpence every day, and if we were to stick to it, we should make more, for on a very muddy day we do better. One day, the best I ever had, from nine o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night, I made seven shillings and sixpence, and got not one bit of silver money among it. Every shilling I got, I went and left at a shop near where my crossing is, for fear I might get into any harm. The shop's kept by a woman we deals with for what we wants, tea and butter, or sugar, or brooms, anything we wants. Saturday night week, I made two and sixpence, that's what I took altogether, up to six o'clock. When we see the rain, we say together, oh, there's a jolly good rain, we'll have a good day tomorrow. If a shower comes on, and we are at our room, which we general are about three o'clock, to get something to eat. Besides, we general go there to see how much each other's taken in the day. Why, out we run with our brooms. We're always sure to make money if there's mud, that's to say, if we look for our money and ask. Of course, if we stand still, we don't. Now there's Lord Fitzharding. He's a good gentleman what lives in Spring Gardens, in a large house. He's got a lot of servants and carriages. Every time he crosses the Charing Cross crossing, he always gives the girl half a sovereign. Note, this statement was taken in June 1856. End note. He doesn't cross often, because, hang it, he's got such a lot of carriages. But when he's on foot, he always does. If they asks him, he doesn't give nothing. But if they touches their caps, he does. The housekeeper at his house is very kind to us. We run errands for her, and when she wants any of her own letters taken to the post, then she calls, and if we are on the crossing, we take some for her. She's a very nice lady, and gives us broken victuals. I've got a share in that crossing. There are three of us, and when he gives the half-sovereign, he always gives it to the girl, and those that are in it shares it. She would do us out of it if she could, but we all takes good care of that, for we are all cheats. At night-time we tumbles, that is, if the policeman ain't nigh. We goes general to Waterloo Place when the opera's on. We sends on one of us ahead as a looker-out, to look for the policeman, and then we follows. It's no good tumbling to gentlemen going to the opera. It's when they're coming back they give us money. When they've got a young lady on their arm, they laugh at us tumbling. Some will give us a penny, others threepence. Sometimes a sixpence or a shilling, and sometimes a halfpenny. We either do the cat and wheel, or else we keep before the gentleman and lady, turning head over heels, putting our broom on the ground and then turning over it. I work a good deal fetching cabs after the opera is over. We general open the doors of those what draw up at the side of the pavement for people to get into as have walked a little down the haymarket looking for a cab. We gets a month in prison if we touch the others by the columns. I once had half a sovereign given me by a gentleman. It was raining awful and I run all about for a cab and at last I got one. The gentleman knew it was half a sovereign because he said, Here, my little man, here's half a sovereign for your trouble. He had three ladies with him, beautiful ones, with nothing on their heads and only capes on their bare shoulders, and he had white kids on, and his regular opera togs too. I liked him very much, and as he was going to give me something, the lady says, Oh, give him something extra. It was pouring with rain, and they couldn't get a cab. They were all engaged, but I jumped on the box of one as was driving along the line. Last Saturday opera night, I made fifteen pence by the gentleman coming out of the opera. After the opera, we go into the haymarket, where all the women are who walk the streets all night. They don't give us no money, but they tell the gentlemen to. Sometimes, when they are talking to the gentlemen, they say, Go away, you young rascal! And if they are saucy, then we say to them, We're not talking to you, my doxy, we're talking to the gentlemen. But that's only if they're rude, for if they speak civil, we always goes. They knows what doxy means. What is it? Why, that they are no better than us. If we are on the crossing and we says to them as they go by, good luck to you, 
They always give us somethink, either that night or the next. There are two with bloomer bonnets, who always give us somethink if we says * Good luck !' Sometimes a gentleman will tell us to go and get them a young lady, and then we goes, and they general gives us sixpence for that. If the gents is dressed finely, we gets them a handsome girl. If they're dressed middlin', then we gets them a middlin' dressed one. But we usual prefers giving a turn to girls that have been kind to us, and they are sure to give us somethink the next night. If we don't find any girls walking, we know where to get them in the houses in the streets round about. We always meet at St. Martin's Steps, the jury house we calls them, at three o'clock in the morning, that's always our hour. We reckon up what we've taken, but we don't divide. Sometimes, if we owe anything where we lodge, the women of the house will be waiting on the steps for us. Then, if we've got it, we pay them. If we haven't, why, it can't be helped, and it goes on. We gets into debt because sometimes the women where we live gets lushy. Then we don't give them anything because they'd forget it. So we spends it ourselves. We can't lodge at what's called model lodging houses, as our hours don't suit them folks. We pay threepence a night for lodging. Food, if we get plenty of money, we buys for ourselves. We buys a pound of bread, that's tuppence farthing, best seconds, and a farthing's worth of dripping. That's enough for a pound of bread, and we gets a haporth of tea and a haporth of sugar. Or if we're hard up, we gets only a penorth of bread. We make our own tea at home. They lends us a kittle, teapot, and cups and saucers and all that. Once or twice a week we gets meat. We all club together and go into Newgate Market and get some pieces cheap and biles them at home. We tosses up who shall have the biggest bit and we divide the broth, a cupful in each basin, until it's lasted out. If any of us has been unlucky, we each gives the unlucky one one or two halfpence. Some of us is obliged at times to sleep out all night and sometimes, if any of us gets nothing, then the other gives him a penny or two and he does the same for us when we are out of luck. Besides, there's our clothes. I'm paying for a pair of boots now. I paid a shilling off Saturday night. When we gets home at half-past three in the morning, whoever cries out, first wash, has it. First of all, we washes our feet, and we all uses the same water. Then we washes our faces and hands and necks, and whoever fetches the fresh water up has first wash. And if the second don't like to go and get fresh, why, he uses the dirty. Whenever we come in, the landlady makes us wash our feet. Very often the stones cuts our feet and makes them bleed. Then we bind a bit of rag round them. We like to put on boots and shoes in the daytime, but at night time we can't because it stops the tumbling. On the Sunday we all have a clean shirt put on before we go out, and then we go and tumble after the omnibuses. Sometimes we do very well on a fine Sunday, when there's plenty of people out on the roofs of the buses. We never do anything on a wet day, but only when it's been raining and then dried up. I have run after a Cremorne bus, when they've thrown us money, as far as from Charing Cross right up to Piccadilly. But if they don't throw us nothing, we don't run very far. I should think we gets at that work, taking one Sunday with another, eightpence all the year round. When there's snow on the ground, we puts our money together and goes and buys an old shovel. And then about seven o'clock in the morning, we goes to the shops and asks them if we shall scrape the snow away. We general gets tuppence every house, but some give sixpence, for it's very hard to clean the snow away, particular when it's been on the ground some time. It's awful cold and gives us chilblains on our feet, but we don't mind it when we're working, for we soon gets hot then. Before winter comes, we general save up our money and buys a pair of shoes. Sometimes we makes a very big snowball and rolls it up to the hotels, and then the gentleman laughs and throws us money. Or else we pelt each other with snowballs, and then they scrambles money between us. We always go to Morley's Hotel at Charing Cross. The police in winter times is kinder to us than in summer, and they only laughs at us. Perhaps it is because there is not so many of us about then, only them as is obligated to find a living for themselves. For many of the boys has fathers and mothers as sends them out in summer, but keeps them at home in winter when it's piercing cold. I have been to the station house, because the police always takes us up if we are out at night. But we're only locked up till morning. That is, if we behaves ourselves when we're taken before the gentleman. Mr. Hall at Bow Street only says, Poor boy, let him go. But it's only when we've done nothing but stop out that he says that. He's a kind old gentleman, but mind, it's only when you have been before him two or three times he says so, because if it's a many times, he'll send you for fourteen days. But we don't mind the police much at night time, because we jumps over the walls round the place at Trafalgar Square, and they don't like to follow us at that game, and only stands looking at you over the parapet. There was one try to jump the wall, 
but he split his trousers all to bits, and now they're afraid. That was old Bandy as bust his breeches, and we all hate him, as well as another we calls Black Diamond, what's general along with the red liners, as we calls the mendicity officers, who goes about in disguise as gentlemen, to take up poor boys caught begging. When we are talking together, we always talk in a kind of slang. Each policeman we gives a regular name. There's Bull's Head, Bandy Shanks, and Old Cherry Legs, and Dot and Carry One. They all knows their names as well as us. We never talks of crossings, but fakes. We don't make no slang of our own, but uses the regular one. A broom doesn't last us more than a week in wet weather, and they costs us tuppence halfpenny each, but in dry weather they are good for a fortnight. Young Mike's Statement The next lad I examined was called Mike. He was a short, stout-set youth, with a face like an old man's, for the features were hard and defined, and the hollows had got filled up with dirt till his countenance was brown as an old wood carving. I have seldom seen so dirty a face, for the boy had been in a perspiration, and then wiped his cheeks with his muddy hands until they were marbled like the covering to a copy-book. The old lady of the house in which the boy lived seemed to be hurt by the unwashed appearance of her lodger. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, and that's God's truth, not to go and sluice yourself afore spaking to the gentleman, she cried, looking alternately at me and the lad, as if asking me to witness her indignation. Mike wore no shoes, but his feet were as black as if cased in gloves with short fingers. His coat had been a man's, and the tails reached to his ankles. One of the sleeves was wanting, and a dirty rag had been wound round the arm in its stead. His hair spread about like a tuft of grass where a rabbit has been squatting. He said, I haven't got neither no father nor no mother. Never had, sir, for father's been dead these two year, and mother's getting on for eight. There was both Irish people, please, sir, and father was a bricklayer. When father was at work in the country, mother used to get work carrying loads at Covent Garden Market. I lived with father till he died, and that was from a complaint in his chest. After that, I lived along with my big brother, what's listed in the Marines now. He used to sweep a crossing in Camden Town, opposite the Southampton Harms, near the Tollgate. He did pretty well up there sometimes, such as on Christmas Day, where he has took as much as six shillings sometimes, and never less than one and sixpence. All the gentlemen's knowed him thereabouts, and one or two used to give him a shilling a week regular. It was he as first of all put me up to sweep a crossing, and I used to take my stand at St. Martin's Church. I didn't see anybody working there, so I planted myself on it. After a time, some other boys come up. They come up and wanted to turn me off, and began hitting me with their brooms. They hit me regular hard with the old stumps. There was five or six of them, so I couldn't defend myself, but told the policeman, and he turned them all away except me, because he saw me on first, sir. Now we are all friends and work together, and all that we earns ourselves we has. On a good day, when it's poured a rain and then leave off sudden, and made it nice and muddy, I've took as much as ninepence. But it's too dry now, and we don't do more than fourpence. At night, I go along with the others tumbling. I does the carton wheel. Note, probably a contraction of Catherine wheel, end note. I throws myself over sideways on my hands with my legs in the air. I can't do it more than four times running, because it makes the blood to my head, and then all the things seems to turn round. Sometimes a chap will give me a lick with a stick, just as I'm going over. Sometimes a regular good hard whack, but it ain't often and we generally gets a halfpenny or a penny by it. The boys as runs after the buses was the first to do these here cat'n wheels. I know the boy as was the very first to do it. His name is Gander, so we calls him the Goose. There's about nine or ten of us in our gang, and as is regular. We lodges at different places, and we has our regular hours for meeting, but we all comes and goes when we likes, only we keeps together so as not to let any others come on the crossings but ourselves. If another boy tries to come on, we cries out, Here's a Russian, and then if he won't go away, we all sets on him and gives him a drubbing. And if he still comes down the next day, we pays him out twice as much and harder. There's never been one down there yet as can lick us all together. If we sees one of our pals being pitched into by other boys, we goes up and helps him. Gander's the leader of our gang because he can tumble backwards. No, that ain't the cat'n wheel, that's tumbling. So he gets more tin give him, and that's why we makes him cap'n. After twelve at night, we goes to the Regent Circus, and we tumbles there to the gentlemen and ladies. The most I ever got was sixpence at a time. The French ladies never give us nothing, but they all says, chit, chit, chit. 
like hissing at us, for they can't understand us, and we are as bad off with them. If it's a wet night, we leaves off work about twelve o'clock, and don't bother with the haymarket. The first as gets to the crossing does the sweeping away of the mud. Then they has in return all the halfpence they can take. When it's been wet every day, a broom gets down to stump in about four days. We either burns the old brooms, or, if we can, we sells them for a halfpenny to some other boy, if he's flat enough to buy them. Gander, the captain of the boy crossing sweepers. Gander, the captain of the gang of boy crossing sweepers, was a big lad of sixteen, with a face devoid of all expression, until he laughed, when the cheeks, mouth and forehead instantly became crumpled up with a wonderful quantity of lines and dimples. His hair was cut short, and stood up in all directions, like the bristles of a hearth broom, and was a light dust tint, matching with the hue of his complexion, which also, from an absence of washing, had turned to a decided drab or what house-painters term a stone colour. He spoke with a lisp, occasioned by the loss of two of his large front teeth, which allowed the tongue, as he talked, to appear through the opening in a round knob like a raspberry. The boy's clothing was in a shocking condition. He had no coat, and his blue-striped shirt was as dirty as a French polisher's rags, and so tattered that the shoulder was completely bare, while the sleeve hung down over the hand like a big bag. From the fish scales on the sleeve of his coat, it had evidently once belonged to some coster in the herring line. The nap was all worn off, so that the lines of the web were showing like a coarse carpet, and instead of buttons, string had been passed through holes pierced at the side. Of course, he had no shoes on, and his black trousers, which, with the grease on them, were gradually assuming a tarpaulin look, were fastened over one shoulder by means of a brace and bits of string. During his statement, he illustrated his account of the tumbling backwards, the catten wheeling, with different specimens of the art, throwing himself about on the floor with an ease and almost grace, and taking up so small a space of the ground for the performance that his limbs seemed to bend as though his bones were flexible like cane. To tell you the blessed truth, I can't say the last shilling I handled. Don't you go a-believing on him, whispered another lad in my ear, while Gander's head was turned. He took thirteen pence last night, he did. It was perfectly impossible to obtain from this lad any account of his average earnings. The other boys in the gang told me that he made more than any of them, but Gander, who is a thorough street beggar, and speaks with a particular whine, and who, directly you look at him, puts on an expression of deep distress, seemed to have made up his mind that if he made himself out to be in great want, I should most likely relieve him so he would not budge an inch from his tuppence a day, declaring it to be the maximum of his daily earnings. Ah, he continued, with a persecuted tone of voice, if I had only got a little money, I'd be a bright youth. The first chances I get of earning a few halfpence, I'll buy myself a coat and be off to the country, and I'll lay something I'd soon be a gentleman then, and come home with a couple of pounds in my pocket, instead of never having ne'er a farthing as now. One of the other lads here exclaimed, Don't go on like that there, Goose. You're making us out all liars to the gentleman. The old woman also interfered. She lost all patience with Gander and reproached him for making a false return of his income. She tried to shame him into truthfulness by saying, Look at my Johnny, my grandson, sir. He's not a quarter of Goose's size, and yet he'll bring me home his shilling, or perhaps eighteen pence or two shillings. For shame on you, Gander. Now, did you make six shillings last week? Now, speak God's truth. What? Six shillings? cried the goose, and he began to look up at the ceiling and shake his hands. Why, I never heard of such a sum. I did once see a half crown, but I don't know as I ever touched e'er a one. Then, added the old woman indignantly, it is because you are idle, Gander, and you don't study when you're on the crossing, but lets the gentlefolk go by without ever a word. That's what it is, sir. The goose seemed to feel the truth of this reproach, for he said with a sigh, I knows I am fickle-minded. He then continued his statement. I can't tell how many brooms I use, for as fast as I gets one, it is took from me. God help me, they watch me put it away, and then up they comes and takes it. What kinds of brooms is the best? Why, as far as I am concerned, I would sooner have a stump on a dry day. It's lighter and handier to carry, but on a wet day, give me a new one. I'm sixteen, Your Honour, and my name's George Gandia, 
and the boys call me the Goose in consequence, for it's a nickname they gives me, though my name ain't spelt with a har at the end, but with a hay, so that I ain't Gander at all, but Gandia, which is a sell for em. God knows what I am, whether I'm Irish or Italian or what, but I was christened here in London, and that's all about it. Father was a bookbinder. I'm sixteen now, and father turned me away when I was nine year old, for mother had been dead before that. I was told my right name by my brother-in-law, who had my register. He's a sweep, sir, by trade, and I wanted to know about my real name when I was going down to the Waterloo. That's a ship as I wanted to get aboard as a cabin boy. I remember the first night I slept out after father got rid of me. I slept on a gentleman's doorstep in the winter, on the 15th January. I packed my shirt and coat, which was a pretty good one, right over my ears, and then scrunched myself into a doorway, and the policeman passed by four or five times without saying on me. I had the mother-in-law at the time, but father used to drink, or else I should never have been as I am, and he came home one night and he says, go out and get me a few halfpence for breakfast, and I said I had never been in the streets of my life and couldn't, and says he, go out and never let me see you no more, and I took him to his word and have never been near him since. Father lived in Barbican at the time, and after leaving him, I used to go to the Royal Exchange, and there I met a boy of the name of Michael, and he first lent me to beg, and made me run after people, saying, Poor boy, sir, please give us a halfpenny to get a morsel of bread. But as far as I got anything, he used to take it away, and knock me about shameful, so I left him, and then I picked up with a chap as taught me tumbling. I soon learned how to do it, and then I used to go tumbling after buses. That was my notion all along, and I hadn't picked up the way of doing it half an hour before I was after that game. I took to crossings about eight year ago, and the very first person as I asked, I had a fourpenny piece give to me. I said to him, Poor little Jack, your honour, and first of all says he, I haven't got no coppers, and then he turns back and gives me a fourpenny bit. I thought I was made for life when I got that. I wasn't working in a gang then, but all by myself and I used to do well, making about a shilling or ninepence a day. I lodged in Church Lane at that time. It was at the time of the Shibition year, note, 1851, end note. As these gangs come up, there was lots of boys that came out sweeping, and that's how they picked up the tumbling off me, seeing me do it up in the park, going along to the Shibition. The crossing at St. Martin's Church was mine, first of all, and when the other lads come to it, I didn't take no heed of them, only for that I'd have been a bright boy by now, but they carried me over like, for when I tried to turn them off, they'd say, in a carrying way, Oh, let us stay on, so I never took no heed of them. There was about thirteen of them in my gang at that time. They made me captain over the lot, I suppose because they thought I was the best tumbler of them. They obeyed me a little. If I told them not to go to any gentleman, they wouldn't, and leave them to me. There was only one feller as used to give me a share of his money, and that was for learning him to tumble. He'd give me a penny or tuppence just as he earned a little or a lot. I taught him all to tumble, and we used to do it near the crossing, and at night along the streets. We used to be sometimes together of a day, some are running after one gentleman, and some after another, but we seldom kept together more than three or four at a time. I was the first to introduce tumbling backwards, and I'm proud of it, yes sir, I'm proud of it. There's another little chap as I'm learning to do it, but he ain't got strength enough in his arms like. Ah! exclaimed a lad in the room. He is a one to tumble as Johnny. Go along the streets like anything. He is the king of the tumblers, continued Gander. King, and I'm cap'n. The old grandmother here joined in. He was taught by a foreign gentleman, sir, whose wife rode at a circus. He used to come here twice a day and give him lessons in this here very room, sir. That's how he got it, sir. Ah, added another lad in an admiring tone. See him and the goose have a race. Away they goes. But Jackie will leave him a mile behind. The history then continued. People liked the tumbling backers and forwards, and it got a good bit of money at first. But they is getting tired with it, and I'm growing too old, I fancy. It hurt me awful at first. I tried it first under a railway arch of the Blackwell Railway, and when I goes backwards, I thought it had cut my head open. It hurts me if I've got a thin cap on. The man as taught me tumbling has gone on the stage. First he went about with swords, fencing in public houses, and then he got engaged. Me and him once tumbled all round the circus at the rotunda one night what was a benefit, and got one and eightpence apiece, 
and all for only five hours and a half, from six to half past eleven, and we acting and tumbling and all that. We had plenty of beer too. We was very much applauded when we did it. I was the first boy as ever did ornamental work in the mud of my crossings. I used to be at the crossing at my corner of Regent Succus, and that's the very place where I fust did it. The very first thing as I did was a hanker. Note, anchor, end note. A regular one, with turn-up sides, and a rope down the centre and all. I sweeped it away clean in the mud, in the shape of the drawing I'd seen. It paid well, for I took one and ninepence on it. The next thing I tried was writing, God save the Queen, and that too paid capital, for I think I got two bob. After that I tried, we har, note, v-r, end note, and a star, and that was a sweep too. I never did no flowers, but I've done imitations of florals and put them all round the crossing, and very pretty it looked too at night. I'd buy a farthing candle and stick it over it, and make it nice and comfortable, so that the people could look at it easy. Whenever I see a carriage coming, I used to douse the glim and run away with it, but the wheels would regularly spile the drawings, and then we'd have all the trouble to put it to rights again, and that we used to do with our hands. I first learned drawing in the mud from a man in Adelaide Street, Strand. He kept a crossing, but he only used to draw em close to the curbstone. He used to keep some soft mud there, and when a carriage come up to the Lowther Arcade, after he'd opened the door and let the lady out, he would set to work, and by the time she come back, he'd have some flowers, or a wee har, or whatever he liked, done in the mud, and underneath he'd write, Please to remember honest industry. I used to stand by and see him do it, until I'd learnt, and when I knowed, I went off and did it at my crossing. I was the first to light up at night, though, and now I wish I'd never done it, for it was that which got me turned off my crossing, and a capital one it was. I thought the gentleman coming from the play would like it, for it looked very pretty. The policeman said I was destructing, note, obstructing, end note, the thoroughfare, and making too much row there, for the people used to stop in the crossing to look, it were so pretty. He took me in charge three times on one night, cause I wouldn't go away, but he let me go again till at last I thought he would lock me up for the night, so I hooked it. It was after this as I went to St. Martin's Church, and I haven't done half as well there. Last night I took three halfpence, but I was larking, or I might have had more. As a proof of the very small expense which is required for the toilette of a crossing sweeper, I may mention that, within a few minutes after Master Gander had finished his statement, he was in possession of a coat, for which he had paid the sum of fivepence. When he brought it into the room, all the boys and the women crowded round to see the purchase. "'It's a very good un,' said the goose. "'It only wants just taking up here and there, and this cuff putting to rights.' And as he spoke, he pointed to tears large enough for a head to be thrust through. "'I've seen that coat afore, Summers,' said one of the women. "'Where did you get it?' "'At the Chandley shop,' answered the goose. End of section 92 Section 93 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 2, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The King of the Tumbling Boy Crossing Sweepers The young sweeper who had been styled by his companions the King was a pretty-looking boy, only tall enough to rest his chin comfortably on the mantelpiece as he talked to me and with a pair of grey eyes that were as bright and clear as drops of sea-water. He was clad in a style in no way agreeing with his royal title, for he had on a kind of dirt-coloured shooting-coat of tweed, which was fraying into a kind of cobweb at the edges and elbows. His trousers, too, were rather faulty, for there was a pink wrinkled dot of flesh at one of the knees, while their length was too great for His Majesty's short legs so that they had to be rolled up at the end like a washerwoman's sleeves. His Royal Highness was of a restless disposition, and whilst talking, lifted up, one after another, the different ornaments on the mantelpiece, frowning and looking at them sideways as he pondered over the replies he should make to my questions. When I arrived at the grandmother's apartment, the King was absent, His Majesty having been sent with a pitcher to fetch some spring water, the king also was kind enough to favour me with samples of his wondrous tumbling powers. He could bend his little legs round till they curved like the long German sausages we see in ham and beef shops, 
and when he turned head over heels, he curled up his tiny body as closely as a woodlouse, and then rolled along, wobbling like an egg. "'The boys call me Johnny,' he said, "'and I'm getting on for a livin', and I goes along with the goose and Harry, a-sweeping at St. Martin's Church and about there. I used, too, to go to the crossing where the statue is, sir, at the bottom of the haymarket. I went along with the others. Sometimes there were three or four of us, or sometimes one, sir. I never used to sweep unless it was wet. I don't go out not before twelve or one in the day. It ain't no use going before that. And beside, I couldn't get up before that. I'm too sleepy. I don't stop out so late as the other boys. They sometimes stop all night, but I don't like that. The goose was out all night along with Martin. They went all along up Piccarilly, and there they climbed over the park railings and went a-birding all by themselves, and then they went to sleep for an hour on the grass, so they says. I likes better to come home to my bed. It kills me for the next day when I do stop out all night. The goose is always out all night. He likes it. Neither father nor mother's alive, sir, but I lives along with grandmother and aunt as owns this room, and I always gives them all I gets. Sometimes I makes a shilling, sometimes sixpence, and sometimes less. I can never take nothing of a day, only of a night because I can't tumble of a day, and I can of a night. The gander taught me tumbling, and he was the first as did it along the crossings. I can tumble quite as well as the goose. I can turn a cat and wheel, and he can't, and I can go further on forwards than him, but I can't tumble backwards as he can. I can't do a handspring, though. Why, a handspring's pitching yourself forwards on both hands, turning over in front, and lighting on your feet. That's very difficult, and very few can do it. There's one little chap, but he's very clever, and can tie himself up in a knot almost. I'm best at cat and wheels. I can do him twelve or fourteen times running, keep on at it. It just does tire you, that's all. When I gets up, I feels quite giddy. I can tumble about forty times over head and heels. I does the most of that, and I thinks it's the most difficult, but I can't say which gentleman likes best. You see, they are a nice sick of the head and heels tumbling. And then very few of the boys can do cat and wheels on the crossings, only two or three besides me. When I see anybody coming, I says, Please, sir, give me a halfpenny," and touches my hair, and then I throws a cat and wheel, and has a look at em. And if I sees they are laughing, then I goes on and throws more of em. Perhaps one in ten will give a chap something. Some of em will give you a thrupney bit, or perhaps sixpence, and others only give you a kick. Well, sir, I should say they likes tumbling over head and heels. If you can keep it up twenty times, then they begins laughing. But if you only does it once, some of them will say, Oh, I can do that myself, and then they don't give nothing. I know they calls me the king of tumblers, and I think I can tumble the best of them. None of them is so good as me, only the goose at tumbling backwards. We don't crab one another when we are sweeping. If we was to crab one another, we'd get to fighting and giving slaps of the jaw to one another. So when we sees anybody coming, we cries, my gentleman and lady coming here, my lady, my two gentlemen's, and if any other chap gets the money, then we says, I named them, now I'll have halves, and if he won't give it, then we'll smug his broom or his cap. I'm the littlest chap among our lot, but if a fellow like the goose was to take my naming, then I'd smug something. I shouldn't mind his licking me, I'd smug his money and get his halfpence or something. If a chap as can't cumble sees a sporting gent coming and names him, he says to one of us tumblers, Now then, who'll give us halves? And then we goes and tumbles and shares. The sporting gentleman's likes tumbling. They kicks up more row laughing than a dozen others. Sometimes at night we goes down to Covent Garden, to where Heavenses is, but not till all the plays is over, cause Heavenses don't shut afore two or three. When the people comes out, we gets tumbling for them. Some of the drunken gentlemen is shocking spiteful, and runs after a chap, and gives us a cut with the cane. Some of the others will give us money, and some will buy our broom off us for sixpence. Me and Jemmy sold the two of our brooms for a shilling to two drunken gentlemen's, and they began kicking up a row, and going before other gentlemen's, and pretending to sweep, and taking off their hats begging, like a mocking of us. They danced about with their brooms, flourishing them in the air, and knocking off people's hats and at last they got into a cab and chucked the brooms away. The drunken gentleman's is always either jolly or spiteful. But I goes only to the haymarket and about Pall Mall now. I used to be going up to Heavensies every night, but I can't take my money up there now. I stands at the top of the haymarket by Windmill Street, and when I sees a lady and gentleman coming out of the Argyle, 
Then I begs of them as they comes across. I says, can't you give me a halfpenny, sir, poor little Jack? I'll stand on my nose for a penny, and then they laughs at that. Goose can stand on his nose as well as me. We puts the face flat down on the ground instead of standing on our heads. There's Ducky Donovan, and the stuttering baboon too, and two others as well as can do it. But the stuttering baboon's getting too big and fat to do it well. He's a very awkward tumbler. It don't hurt, only at larning, cause you bears more on your hands than your nose. Sometimes he says, well, let us see you do it. And then perhaps they'll search in their pockets and say, oh, I haven't got any coppers. So then we'll force em, and perhaps they'll pull out their purse and gives us a little bit of silver. Ah, we works hard for what we gets. And then there's the policemen birching us. Some of em is so spiteful they takes up their belt, what they uses round their waist to keep their coat tight, and they'll hit us with the buckle. But we generally gives em the lucky dodge and gets out of their way. One night, two gentlemen, officers they was, was standing in the haymarket, and a drunken man passed by. There was snow on the ground, and we'd been begging of them, and says one of them, I'll give you a shilling if you'll knock that drunken man over. We was three of us, so we set on him, and soon had him down. After he got up, he went and told the policeman, but we all cut round different ways and got off, and then met again. We didn't get the shilling, though, cause a boy crabbed us. He went up to the gentleman and says he, Give it me, sir, I'm the boy. And then we says, No, sir, it's us. So says the officer, I shan't give it to none of you and puts it back again in his pockets. We broke a broom over the boy as Crab does, and then we cut down Waterloo Place, and afterwards we come up to the haymarket again, and there we met the officers again. I did a cat and wheel, and then says I, Then won't you give me un now? And they says, Go and sweep some mud on that woman. So I went and did it, and then they takes me in a pastry shop at the corner, and they tells me to tumble on the tables in the shop. I nearly broke one of them, they were so delicate. They give me a fourpenny meat pie and two penny sponge cakes, which I puts in my pocket, cause there was another sharing with me. The lady of the shop kept on screaming, Go and fetch me a police, take the dirty boy out, cause I was standing on the tables in my muddy feet, and the officers was a-bursting their sides with laughing, and says they, No, he shan't stir. I was frightened, cause if the police had come, they'd been safe and sure to have took me. They made me tumble from the door to the end of the shop and back again, and then I turned him a catten wheel and was near knocking down all the things as was on the counter. They didn't give me no money, only pies, but I got a shilling another time for tumbling to some French ladies and gentlemen in a pastry cook shop under the colonnade. I often goes into a shop like that. I've done it a good many times. There was a gentleman once as belonged to a circus, note, circus, end note, as wanted to take me with him abroad and teach me tumbling. He had a little moustache and used to belong to Drury Lane Playhouse, riding on horses. I went to his place and stopped there some time. He taught me to put my leg round my neck, and I was just getting along nicely with the splits, note, going down on the ground with both legs extended, end note, when I left him. They, note, the splits, end note, used to hurt worst of all, very bad for the thighs. I used to to hang with my leg round his neck. When I did anything he liked, he used to be clapping me on the back. He wasn't so very stunning well off for he never had what I calls a good dinner. Grandmother used to have a better dinner than he. Perhaps only a bit of scrag of mutton between three of us. I don't like meat nor butter, but I like stripping, and they never had none there. The wife used to drink, I very much, on the sly. She used, when he was out, to send me round with a bottle and sixpence to get a quarter of gin for her, and she'd take it with three or four oysters. Grandmother didn't like the notion of my going away, so she went down one day and says she, I wants my child. And the wife says, that's according to the master's likings. And then grandmother says, what, not my own child? And then grandmother began talking. And at last, when the master come home, he says to me, which will you do, stop here or go home with your grandmother? So I come along with her. I've been sweeping the crossings, getting on for two years. Before that, I used to go cat and wheeling after the buses. I don't like the sweeping, and I don't think there's e'er a one of us what likes it. In the winter we has to be out in the cold, and then in summer we have to sleep out all night, or go asleep on the church steps, regular tired out. One of us'll say at night, oh, I'm sleepy now, who's game for a doss? I'm for a doss. And then we go eight or ten of us into a doorway of the church, where they keep the dead in a kind of airy-like underneath, and there we go to sleep. The most of the boys has got no homes. 
Perhaps they've got the price of a lodging, but they're hungry, and they eats the money, and then they must lay out. There's some of 'em will stop out in the wet for perhaps the sake of a halfpenny, and get themselves sopping wet. I think all our chaps would like to get out of the work if they could. I'm sure Goose would, and so would I. All the boys call me the King, because I tumble so well, and some calls me Pluck, and some Judy. I'm called Pluck, cause I'm so plucked a-going at the gentleman, Tommy Donovan. Tipperty tight, we calls him, cause his trousers is so tight, he can hardly move in them sometimes. He was the first as called me Judy. Donovan once swallowed a pill for a shilling. A gentleman in the haymarket says, If you'll swallow this here pill, I'll give you a shilling. And Jimmy says, All right, sir. And he puts it in his mouth, and went to the water pails near the cab stand and swallowed it. All the chaps in our gang likes me, and we all likes one another. We always shows what we gets given to us to eat. Sometimes we gets one another up wild, and then that fetches up a fight, but that isn't often. When two of us fights, the others stand round and sees fair play. There was a fight last night between Broca's Bones, as we calls Anthony Hones, and Neddy Hall, the sparrow, or spider, we calls him. Something about the root of a pineapple, as we was aiming with at one another, and that called up a fight. We all stood round and saw them at it, but neither of them licked, for they give in for today, and they're to finish it tonight. We makes them fight fair. We all of us likes to see a fight, but not to fight ourselves. Hones is sure to beat, as spider is as thin as a wafer, and all bones. I can lick the spider, though he's twice my size. The Street Where the Boy Sweepers Lodged I was anxious to see the room in which the gang of boy crossing sweepers lived, so that I might judge of their peculiar style of housekeeping, and form some notion of their principles of domestic economy. I asked young Harry and the Goose to conduct me to their lodgings, and they at once consented, the Goose prefacing his compliance with the remark that it weren't such as gentlemen has been accustomed to, but then I must take him as they was. The boys led me in the direction of Drury Lane, and before entering one of the narrow streets which branch off, like the side-bones of a fish's spine, from that long thoroughfare, they thought fit to caution me that I was not to be frightened, as nobody would touch me, for all was very civil. The locality consisted of one of those narrow streets, which, were it not for the paved cartway in the centre, would be called a court. Seated on the pavement at each side of the entrance was a coster woman with her basket before her, and her legs tucked up mysteriously under her gown into a round ball, so that her figure resembled in shape the plaster tumblers sold by the Italians. These women remained as inanimate as if they had been carved images, and it was only when a passenger went by that they gave signs of life, by calling out in a low voice, like talking to themselves, Two for three harpins, herons, fine hingins, the street itself is like the description given of thoroughfares in the east. Opposite neighbours could not exactly shake hands out of the window, but they could talk together very comfortably. And indeed, as I passed along, I observed several women with their arms folded up like a cat's paws on the sill, and chatting with their friends over the way. Nearly all the inhabitants were costermongers, and indeed the narrow cartway seemed to have been made just wide enough for a truck to wheel down it a beer shop and a general store, together with a couple of sweeps, whose residences were distinguished by a broom over the door, formed the only exceptions to the street-selling class of inhabitants. As I entered the place, it gave me the notion that it belonged to a distinct coster colony, and formed one large hawker's home, where everybody seemed to be doing just as he liked, and I was stared at as if considered an intruder. Women were seated on the pavement knitting and repairing their linen, the doorways were filled up with bonnetless girls, who wore their shawls over their head, as the Spanish women do their mantillas, and the youths in corduroy and brass buttons, who were chatting with them, leant against the walls as they smoked their pipes, and blocked up the pavement, as if they were the proprietors of the place. Little children formed a convenient bench out of the curbstone, and a party of four men were seated on the footway, playing with cards which had turned to the colour of brown paper from long usage and marking the points with chalk upon the flags. The parlour windows of the houses had all of them wooden shutters, as thick and clumsy-looking as a kitchen flap table, the paint of which had turned to the dull dirt colour of an old slate. Some of these shutters were evidently never used as a security for the dwelling, 
but served only as tables on which to chalk the accounts of the day's sales. Before most of the doors were costermongers, trucks, some standing ready to be wheeled off, and others stained and muddy with the day's work. A few of the costers were dressing up their barrows, arranging the sieves of waxy-looking potatoes, and others taking the stiff herrings, browned like a meerschaum with the smoke they had been dried in, from the barrels beside them, and spacing them out in pennyworths on their trays. You might guess what each costermonger had taken out that day by the heap of refuse swept into the street before the doors. One house had a blue mound of mussel shells in front of it, another a pile of the outside leaves of broccoli and cabbage, turning yellow and slimy with bruises and moisture. Hanging up beside some of the doors were bundles of old strawberry pottles, stained red with the fruit. Over the trap doors to the cellars were piles of market gardener's sieves, ruddled like a sheep's back, with big red letters. In fact, everything that met the eye seemed to be in some way connected with the coster's trade. From the windows, poles stretched out, on which blankets, petticoats and linen were drying, and so numerous were they that they reminded me of the flags hung out at a Paris fete. Some of the sheets had patches as big as trapdoors let into their centres, and the blankets were, many of them, as full of holes as a pigeon house. As I entered the court, a row was going on, and from a first-floor window, a lady, whose hair sadly wanted brushing, was haranguing a crowd beneath, throwing her arms about like a drowning man, and, in her excitement, thrusting her body half out of her temporary rostrum, as energetically as I have seen Punch lean over his theatre. The willin dragged her, she shouted, by the hair of her head, at least three yards into the court, the willin, and then he kicked her, and the blood was on his boot. It was a sweep who had been behaving in this cowardly manner, but still he had his defenders in the women around him, one with very shiny hair and an Indian kerchief round her neck, answered the lady in the window by calling her a D, blank D, old cat, whilst the sweep's wife rushed about clapping her hands together as quickly as if she was applauding at a theatre, and styled some day or other, an old wagabones, as she wouldn't dirty her hands to fight with. This row had the effect of drawing all the lodgers to the windows, their heads popping out as suddenly as dogs from their kennels in a fancier's yard. The Boy Sweeper's Room The room where the boys lodged was scarcely bigger than a coach-house, and so low was the ceiling that a flypaper suspended from a clothesline was on a level with my head, and had to be carefully avoided when I moved about. One corner of the apartment was completely filled up by a big four-post bedstead, which fitted into a kind of recess, as perfectly as if it had been built to order. The old woman who kept this lodging had endeavoured to give it a homely look of comfort by hanging little black-framed pictures, scarcely bigger than pocket-books, on the walls. Most of these were sacred subjects, with large yellow glories round their heads, though between the drawing representing the bleeding heart of Christ and the Saviour bearing the cross was an illustration of a red-waistcoated sailor smoking his pipe. The adoration of the shepherds again was matched on the other side of the fireplace by a portrait of Daniel O'Connell. A chest of drawers was covered over with a green baize cloth on which books, shelves and clean glasses were tidily set out where so many persons, for there were about eight of them, including the landlady, her daughter and grandson, could all sleep, puzzled me extremely. The landlady wore a frilled nightcap, which fitted so closely to the skull that it was evident she had lost her hair. One of her eyes was slowly recovering from a blow which, to use her own words, a black gayard gave her. Her lip, too, had suffered in the encounter, for it was swollen and cut. I have a nice flock bid for the boys, she said, when I inquired into the accommodation of her lodging house, where three of them can sleep easy and comfortable. It's a large bed, sir, said one of the boys, and a warm covering over us, and you see it's better than a regular lodging house, for if you want a knife or a cup, you don't have to leave something on it till it's returned. The old woman spoke up for her lodgers, telling me that they were good boys and very honest. For, she added, they pays me regular every night, which is threepence. The only youth, as to whose morals she seemed to be at all doubtful, was the goose, for he kept late hours, and sometimes came home without a penny in his pocket.
B. The Girl Crossing Sweepers. The girl crossing sweeper sent out by her father. A little girl who worked by herself at her own crossing gave me some curious information on the subject. This child had a peculiarly flat face with a button of a nose, while her mouth was scarcely larger than a buttonhole. When she spoke, there was not the slightest expression visible in her features. Indeed, one might have fancied she wore a mask and was talking behind it. But her eyes were shining the while, as brightly as those of a person in a fever, and kept moving about, restless with her timidity. The green frock she wore was fastened close to the neck, and was turning into a kind of mouldy tint. She also wore a black stuff apron, stained with big patches of gruel, from feeding baby at home, as she said. Her hair was tidily dressed, being drawn tightly back from the forehead, like the by a broom girl's, and, as she stood with her hands thrust up her sleeves, she curtsied each time before answering, bobbing down like a float, as though the floor under her had suddenly given way. I'm twelve years old, please, sir, and my name is Margaret R., and I sweep a crossing in New Oxford Street by Dunn's Passage, just facing Moses and Sons, sir, by the Catholic school, sir. Mother's been dead these two years, sir, and father's a working cutler, sir, and I lives with him, but he don't get much to do, and so I'm obligated to help him doing what I can, sir. Since mother's been dead, I've had to mind my little brother and sister, so that I haven't been to school. But when I goes a-crossing sweeping, I takes them along with me, and they sits on the steps close by, sir. If it's wet, I has to stop at home and take care of them, for father depends upon me for looking after them. Sister's three and a half year old, and brother's five year, so he's just beginning to help me, sir. I hope he'll get something better than a-crossing when he grows up. First of all, I used to go singing songs in the streets, sir. It was when father had no work, so he stopped at home and looked after the children. I used to sing The Red, White and Blue and Mother is the Battle Over and The Gypsy Girl and sometimes I'd get fourpence or fivepence and sometimes I'd have a chance of making ninepence, sir. Sometimes, though, I'd take a shilling of a Saturday night in the markets. At last, the songs grew so stale, people wouldn't listen to them and, as I can't read, I couldn't learn any more, sir. My big brother and father used to learn me some but I never could get enough out of them for the streets. Besides, father was out of work still, and we couldn't get money enough to buy ballads with, and it's no good singing without having them to sell. We live over there, sir. Note, pointing to a window on the other side of the narrow street. End note. The notion come into my head all of itself to sweep crossings, sir. As I used to go up Regent Street, I used to see men and women and girls and boys sweeping, and the people giving them money, so I thought I'd do the same thing. That's how it come about. Just now the weather is so dry, I don't go to my crossing, but goes out singing. I've learnt some new songs, such as The Queen of the Navy Forever, and The Widow's Last Prayer, which is about the wars. I only go sweeping in wet weather, because then's the best time. When I am there, there's some ladies and gentlemen as gives to me regular. I knows them by sight, and there's a beer shop where they give me some bread and cheese whenever I go. I generally takes about sixpence or sevenpence or eightpence on the crossing from about nine o'clock in the morning till four in the evening when I come home. I don't stop out at nights because father won't let me and I'm got to be home to see to baby. My broom costs me tuppence halfpenny, and in wet weather it lasts a week but in dry weather we seldom uses it. When I sees the buses and carriages coming I stands on the side for I'm afeard of being runned over. In winter I goes out and cleans ladies' doors, general about Lincoln's Inn, for the housekeepers. I gets tuppence a door, but it takes a long time when the ice is hardened, so that I can't do only about two or three. I can't tell whether I shall always stop at sweeping, but I've no clothes, and so I can't get a situation. For though I'm small and young, yet I could do housework such as cleaning. No, sir, there's no gang on my crossing. I'm all alone. If another girl or a boy was to come and take it when I'm not there, I should stop on it as well as him or her, and go shares with him. Girl Crossing Sweeper I was told that a little girl formed one of the association of young sweepers, and at my request one of the boys went to fetch her. She was a clean-washed little thing, with a pretty expressive countenance, and each time she was asked a question she frowned, like a baby in its sleep, while thinking of the answer. In her ears she wore, instead of rings, loops of string, which the doctor had put there because her sight was wrong. A cotton velvet bonnet, scarcely larger than the sunshades worn at the seaside, 
hung on her shoulders, leaving exposed her head, with the hair as rough as tow. Her green stuff gown was hanging in tatters, with long three-cornered rents as large as penny kites, showing the grey lining underneath, and her mantle was separated into so many pieces that it was only held together by the braiding at the edge. As she conversed with me, she played with the strings of her bonnet, rolling them up, as if curling them, on her singularly small and also singularly dirty fingers. "'I'll be fourteen, sir, a fortnight before next Christmas. I was born in Lickerpond Street, Gray's Inn Lane. Father come over from Ireland, and was a bricklayer. He had pains in his limbs, and wasn't strong enough, so he give it over. He's dead now. Been dead a long time, sir. I was a littler girl then than I am now, for I wasn't above a living at that time. I lived with mother after father died. She used to sell things in the streets. Yes, sir, she was a coster. About a twelve-month after father's death, mother was taken bad with the cholera and died. I then went along with both grandmother and grandfather, who was a porter in Newgate Market. I stopped there until I got a place as servant of all work. I was only turned, just turned, eleven then. I worked along with a French lady and gentleman in Hatton Garden who used to give me a shilling a week and my tea. I used to go home to grandmother's to dinner every day. I hadn't to do any work, only just to clean the room and nuss the child. It was a nice little thing. I couldn't understand what the French people used to say, but there was a boy working there, and he used to explain to me what they meant. I left them because they was a going to a place called Italy. Perhaps you may have heard tell of it, sir. Well, I suppose they must have been Italians, but we calls everybody, whose talk we don't understand, French. I went back to grandmother's, but after grandfather died, she couldn't keep me, and so I went out begging. She sent me. I carried lucifer matches and stay laces first. I used to carry about a dozen laces, and perhaps I'd sell six out of them. I suppose I used to make about sixpence a day, and I used to take it home to grandmother, who kept and fed me. At last, finding I didn't get much at begging, I thought I'd go crossing-sweeping. I saw other children doing it. I says to myself, I'll go and buy a broom. And I spoke to another little girl who was sweeping up Holborn, who told me what I was to do. But, says she, don't come and cut up me. I went first to Holborn, near to home, at the end of Red Lion Street. Then I was frightened of the cabs and carriages. But I'd get there early, about eight o'clock, and sweep the crossing clean. And I'd stand at the side on the pavement, and speak to the gentlemen and ladies before they crossed. There was a couple of boys, sweepers at the same crossing before I went there. I went to them and asked if I might come and sweep there too, and they said yes, if I would give them some of the halfpence I got. These was boys about as old as I was, and they said if I earned sixpence, I was to give them tuppence apiece, but they never gave me nothing of theirs. I never took more than sixpence, and out of that I had to give fourpence, so that I did not do so well as with the laces. The crossings made my hands sore with the sweeping, and as I got so little, I thought I'd try somewhere else. Then I got right down to the fountains in Trafalgar Square, by the crossing at the Staty on horseback. There was a good many boys and girls on that crossing at the time, five of them, so I went along with them. When I first went, they said, Here's another fresh un. They come up to me and says, Are you going to sweep here? And I says, Yes. And they says, You mustn't come here, there's too many. And I says, There are different ones every day for they're not regular there, but shift about, sometimes one lot of boys and girls, and the next day another. They didn't say another word to me, and so I stopped. It's a capital crossing, but there's so many of us it spiles it. I seldom gets more than sevenpence a day, which I always takes home to grandmother. I've been on that crossing about three months. They always calls me Ellen, my regular name, and behaves very well to me. If I see anybody coming, I call them out as the boys does, and then they are mine. There's a boy and myself, and another strange girl, works on our side of the statty, and another lot of boys and girls on the other. I like Saturdays the best day of the week, because that's the time as gentlemen as has been at work has their money, and then they are more generous. I get more then, perhaps ninepence, but not quite a shilling, on the Saturday. I've had a threepenny bit give to me, but never sixpence. It was a gentleman, and I should know him again. Ladies gives me less than gentlemen. I follow him, saying, if you please, sir, give a poor girl a halfpenny. But if the police are looking, I stop still. I never goes out on Sunday, but stops at home with grandmother. I don't stop out at nights like the boys, but I gets home by ten at latest.
End of section 93. End of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 2, by Henry Mayhew.